65. Scam number 18,750. I'm having a drink with my old buddy, a new partner in the city cafe, breaking the good news. Renton, who's been looking like he's put on a bit of podge, is staring at the letter I've handed him, then at me, with undisguised awe. I don't know how the fuck you pulled this one off, Simon. It's all down to the shore that I ran off and sent them, I explain. I can tell by his look he thinks it was down to that cunt Miz using his influence. Let him think what he likes. Renton shrugs and breaks into an admiring smile. Well, we've done it your way so far, and it's no worked out too bad, he tells me, examining the letter again. Full exhibition at the Cannes Adult Film Festival. That is a result by any standards. Normally, flattery is the most fragrant balm to the ego, but when it's spilling from the rent boy's lips, you're always bracing yourself for that follow-up kick in the chops. We're discussing the setting up of our film's website, www.sevenrides.com, and what we want to go on to it. My main objective, though, is to ensure that we have a product to sell. That means that some mug has to sit in a warehouse in Amsterdam and stuff videos into boxes. And I only know one person who claims they have loads to do in the dam. So we head off on our little John, but it's far from pleasant, sitting in a warehouse doing dog's body work. The place feels horrible, claustrophobic. When I get back to Edinburgh, I need a session out of porty baths, so I swallow hard and incur the hideous taxi cost all the way out there. Renton accompanies me as far as the city centre and grudgingly chips in a tenner. Sitting in the tanks of the Aerotone baths at Portobello, enjoying the warm waters and the pummeling sensation of the jets. I'm thinking this has been one of the main things I've missed in London over the last decade. Ah, the aerotone baths at Porty Pool. It's impossible to explain to the uninitiated the sheer trance-like, luxuriant mode one slips into here, way beyond any sauna or Turkish baths. So deliciously old school, this big Jules Verne tin tank with its dials and valves and pipes. The old mingers who come in during the day love it here. I'm thinking that this is a frame of mind in which to spread the good news, so reluctantly getting out and wrapping a towel round my waist, I repair to my locker on the mobby. The signal's strong for indoors. I call everyone I can think of and tell them the news about our canned selection. Nicky shrieks with delight. Beryl gives a grudging. Right, as if I've told him that a ten-year jail sentence he's just received has been cut by a couple of months. Terry reacts characteristically. Can he wait? All that French fanny and all the posh birds that'll be gunting on it. I head down to Leith in the pub. I'm about to sneak upstairs to my office to check the banana zuri messages when Morag ambushes me on the bend in the stairs. Those startled mad eyes under a new permed mop making me stop in shock. Mo, you've had your hair done. Suits you, I smile. Mo is not happy, seeming now totally impervious to my charms. Never mind my hair, Simon. There's a man been doing here for the evening news, asking all sorts of questions about you, and do I care about you as making any films upstairs and that. What did you say? I tell him I didn't care now about it, she says, shaking her head. Morag's no grass. Of that I'm certain. Thanks, Mo. This is fucking harassment. If that creep comes in here again, tell me. I'll have him fucking well shot and I'll have his house burned down a spit into a shocked face. I'm about to make good my escape upstairs when the old cow moos. I need help doing here, Simon. Ali's had to go up to the hospital. Our man got hurt. Who, Spud? Aye. What happened? They didn't ken, but he's in a right mess by the sound of it. Right, give me five, I say, feeling strangely concerned about Murphy. I mean, it's not as if we're boozing buddies anymore, but I wouldn't actively wish harm on the flea bag. I back up the stairs, waving at that startled face below me. Got to check the mail. And Paula's been on from Spain, wondering how things are. I'm telling her fine, but she's my pal. I can't keep covering up for you, Simon. I'm not going to lie to Paula. I stop in my tracks. What do you mean? Well, that Mr Creswell for the brewery, nice fellow, he says that you've no been paid for the last week's delivery. I tell him you'd get back to him to sort it out. I think about this before addressing Mo. Creswell's a warrior, a corporate man, doesn't understand that business operates on credit and cash flow. 
No, just sits there in his fancy Fountain Bridge office pretending that he understands the real business world. A day at the coalface would kill him. I'll speak to him. I ran out, getting up to the office for a quick fortifying line before attending to bar duties. I've called a meeting this evening in the pub. Fuck knows why. To keep them up with the state of play. More likely it's because the Ching's cursing through the system and I'd much rather bend some ears up here than serve alcohol to the old and young fools downstairs. I liked it to keep Forrester out of it, thinking that there would be bother if he and Renton were in the same building. Of course, Renton doesn't even do me the fucking courtesy of showing up. Rab Burrow sullenly troops in, and Terry arrives and immediately asks to be weighed in. Every cunt seems to have gone money mad all of a sudden. Who the fuck do they think I am? That's fucking Renton on the mobby, I'll bet, putting ideas into every fucker's head. Sorry, Tell, a distinct shortage of stocks of tinned pigeon, or if you prefer, no, can do. So that's it? I'll get out for what I did? You're not on a profit share, Terry, I explain. You got paid as a shagger. I was always the boy running the show. Fair enough, he says with a grin that makes me feel decidedly uneasy. That's the way it goes, eh? Terry's enthusiasm makes him a useful fellow traveller at one point. His lack of ambition means that he'll never be a player in the industry. You do your best. You afford them the opportunity to learn and grow. The rest is up to them. But he's taken this well. Too well. So let's see how the cunt takes this. We have a problem, I tersely announce. Obviously we can't all go to Cannes, cost prohibits. So it'll be me, Nicky... Mel and Curtis. The talent. Rents as well, I need him on the business side. The rest are too many cooks, sit you. I can't go anyway, Rab says. No way the barn and the course and that. Terry abruptly stands up and walks towards the door. Tez, I shout, trying to prevent my face from twisting gleefully. He turns and says, Why the fuck ask us doing here if I'm no getting paid or going to can? To be fair, I can think of no good reason, so I'm literally quite speechless as he continues. You're wasting my fucking time here. I'm away to the hosie to see Spud, he growls and exits. Me and all, Rab endorses, getting up and following him. Lasers or what? I'm thinking that Rab doesn't know Spud, so I take it to mean that he's leaving rather than going on visiting duties. At this point, Nicky comes in and apologises for being late. She watches in concern as they depart. I turn to her. Fuck them right up the shite-encrusted arseholes. We don't need them. Never did. You simply cannot let the tail wag the dog, and I'm tired of feeding their delusions of adequacy. Craig looks tense, and Ursula laughs and Ronnie grins. Nicky, Gina and Mel look at me as if I should be saying more. When the sales come through, we'll work it all out between us, I explain. Well, you can't divvy money when there's none to fucking divvy. I give the rest of them a lecture on the economics of the industry, which goes over most of their heads present. Eventually they shoot off, only Nicky holding back. I can tell that she's not happy with the way I've treated Rab and Terry. I'm feeling a tightening inside me as I experience annoying contempt for her, which is horrible, because I'm probably in love with the woman. Now she's sensing something, making small talk, tell me that she's thinking of jacking in the sauna. I tell her that it's not a bad idea, as these places are ran by sleezoids. I start to wonder whether she's gearing up to try and hit me for some cash. Eventually she goes to her shift and I arrange to see her later tonight. So it seems my crew has diminished, but I can't be bothered thinking about foolhardy rascals like Terry at the moment. I go to the office and chop out and rack up a juicy line as a newspaper twat calls. Can I speak to Simon Williamson? Mr Williamson's not around at the moment, I tell him. Apparently he's playing fives up at the Jack Kane. Or it might be Portobello. When are you expecting him back? I'm not really sure at the present. Mr Williamson has been busy of late. To whom am I speaking? I'm Mr Francis Begby. Well, if you could get Mr Williamson to call me when he gets back. I'll leave the message. But Simon's very much a free spirit, I state to the receiver, as I use a £50 note to hoover up some ching. Well, make sure he calls me. It's important. There are some things I need to clarify. The pompous voice drones. You can suck my dirty jailbird cock, I tell him, slamming down the phone as the lines of Ching stiffens my spine. I enrol the crisp fifty, delighting in its beauty. Money, 
gives you the luxury of not caring about it. You can affect to find it crass and vulgar, but see how crass and vulgar it is when there's none of it in your pocket. First of all, though, the big one beckons. Let's do the can-can. Sixty-six, Whores of Amsterdam, Part Nine. I've had enough of high maintenance relationships. Yet here I am, back in Amsterdam, back in another one of sorts, because sick boy is on one of his sulkers. We're sitting in a cold, drafty warehouse in Leyland on the city outskirts, putting video cards into cases and cases into boxes. This is Mrs. Place, and it's a shit house with all sorts of rubbish stacked ceiling high on pallets. It's got the sick blue-yellow fluorescent strip lighting which bounces off the aluminium panels that hang from rust-red girder frames. I'm trying to think margins. 2,000 times 10 pounds divided by 2 equals 10,000 pounds. But this is taking yonks and sick boys unhappy. I'd forgotten the extent of the cunt's capacity to complain, to moan out loud at annoyances which should be fleeting enough to keep to yourself. But even that's preferable to this silent brooding, which makes the air as heavy as tar. It's obvious that he feels this isn't glam enough for him, but he's forgetting that once I sense he's annoyed, I can just relax and enjoy his whining and moping. We need staff rent in, he says, drumming on an empty box that sits on his thigh. Where's that kraut bird of yours? She's definitely out of the picture now that Diana's getting a length. I keep silent, working on my old principle that sick boy and your romantic life should be kept apart. Now the cunt has done this time around has convinced me to reevaluate that philosophy. Piss off, stop fucking whinging and keep packing, I'm telling him. Thinking all the time we're indeed far, I'm hoping. I keep my head lowered in case he reads this in my eyes. I can feel those big lamps burning at me. Watch yourself getting back with that Diane bird, he says. In Italy we have a phrase about reheating old soup, never work soup. Reheat cabbage, mate. Minestra riscaldata. I want to ram my fist into the cunt's face. Instead, I smile at him. Then he seems to think about something, a nod and a stern kind of approval. But at least she's the right age. I love women at that age. Never go out with a bird in their thirties. They're all bitter, poisonous cows with an agenda. In fact, under 26 if possible. But no teenagers, a bit too immature and they great after a while. No, 20 to 25 is vintage time for lassies, he explains then starts ranting through the jukebox of his obsessions. I get old favourites. Film, music, Alex Miller, Sean Connery, and new ones. Bad Manchester Perms, Crack Hours, Alex McLeish, Frank Soze, television presenters, junk movies. He's going on and on and I can't be bothered. I just can't be fucking well arsed saying something like... Solaris shites all over 2001 and then listening to him arguing vehemently against it or alternatively waiting for him to say it and then being expected to argue the other viewpoint and that way we look at each other so challengingly as if to agree even if we do is a sign that we're a feet poofs I can't be bothered with it and I can't be bothered to tell him that I can't be bothered I'm aware, as I tuck yet another representation of Nicky's arse cheeks into a box cover, that my ears are starting to close over. Nicky has a lovely arse, no doubt about that, but when you've stuck a paper representation of it into the 300th box, it becomes less attractive. Maybe pornographic images are something you shouldn't view repeatedly. Perhaps they do desensitise you. Erode your sexuality. Sick boys' drones increase. Plans, betrayals, the lot of a sensitive man surrounded by junkies, masons, scumbags, wasters, whores and lassies who don't know how to dress properly. 
I hear myself going, hmm, in a steady agreement, but after a bit, sick boy shaking me and shouting, Renton, are you totally fucking Lee Van? He asks. I'm a bit out of the Leith rhyming slang just now, so it takes me a while to register. No. Fucking listen then, you rude cunt. Conversation. What? I said I want to drink tea from Bone China, he tells me. He sees that he's got my attention, because I'm fucked if I know what the cunt's on about. Then he looks around and qualifies his statement. No, what I really want to do is drink tea in an environment where this stands out, this porcelain shite. He holds up an Ajax mug. And Bone China fucking well Disney, he snaps, suddenly throwing down a video cassette box and jumping to his feet. His Adam's apple bulges in his neck like a small pig in a snake's belly. And then he hurls the cup against the wall, and I shudder as it smashes into pieces. Fuck off, that's Mrs. Cup, you cunt, I tell him. Sorry, Mark, he says, sheepishly. It's the nerves. Too much ching these days. I'll have to take it easier. I've never really liked Charlie, but a lot of people feel that way and still ram up their hooters, just because it's there. People consume shite that does them no good at all, often just because they can. It's naive to expect drugs to be exempt from the laws of modern consumer capitalism, especially when, as a product, they best help define it. It takes us another two tense, sick hours to finish our turgid task. My hands are calloused and my thumb and wrist ache. I look at the boxed piles of videos, sitting stacked up. Aye, we now have the product, as he loves to call it ready for distribution after Cannes. I still can't believe that he's got us a place at the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, not really THE Cannes Film Festival, but the adult movie event which runs concurrently. When I qualify this, usually when he's chatting up a woman, which he always seems to be doing, it gets right on his nerves. It is a film festival and it is Cannes, so what's the fucking problem? I'm happy to leave the warehouse and get back into town. We're living it up a little this time, staying at the American Hotel on the Leeds Supreme. I've had a drink in its bar a few times, but never, ever thought I'd stay there. We sit at the bar, paying the mad prices, but we can afford it now, and we'll be able to for some time. Well, some of us will. Sixty-seven. Fitba on Sky. I'm waiting on Kate coming in with a bairn to make my fucking tea before I goes down the fucking pub to watch the Fitba on Sky. She better fucking gnash, because time's ticking away. So there's me sitting watching that big fucking telly. It's never off now. Got the fucking box for Sky and all. But I'm watching the game down the booze of the night. Better atmosphere. I keep thinking back to Easter and that fucking nonce animal. There was a bit about it at the time, but just the usual shite. Did anybody see a group of youths leaving the fucking pub, blah, blah, blah? Good time today, some cunt, a public holiday. People's got more to think about than a fucking stoat. Sometimes I fucking think, but I'd better see Charlie again. And they all cunts. Make sure that nobody fucking blabs. Cause I've made the fucking world a better place. Cause they fucking things deserve to die. That's the way that I fucking well see it. Too right. The police, if they were being honest, would tell you the same thing. I agree with the paper. The news of the world. Tell us where all the cunts live, and we'll go round there and fucking well exterminate them all. Solve the whole fucking problem straight away. Like that twisted cunt Murphy. Supposed to be a fucking mate, like Renton was. I'll fucking rip his hair out and piss in the hole. And then you get worried. Worried that you're turning into one of them. What are they fucking weirdos in that, like in America? That's how they talk. Then you look at that fucking book, that fucking Bible. Plenty of them in the fucking nick. Then I can how any cunt can read that shite. 
doth this begat that. It's not even in the Queen's fucking English. But they tell us that the Bible says that God made man in his own image. So I take that as meaning that no to try to be like God would be a fucking big insult to the cunt. That's the way I see it. So I, I was playing God when I wasted the nonce cunt. So fucking what? I switched channels. But it's everywhere on the telly. Nonces, paedophiles, stoats, the fucking lot. There's some fucking rag psychologist cunt saying that they've all been abused themselves. That's how they do it. Fucking shite. Tons of cunts are fucking well abused and it doesn't make them go like that. So you could say that I took fucking pity on that cunt because he's just going to get abused again. In the neck and that. Best fucking deal or in. The hoose is there in my fucking nothing and fuck knows where she's got to. So I nips downstairs for a news. It's fucking freezing out here so I'm right back up again with the paper. There's the usual shite. But then I see something that makes a stop. Cunt! My hair bangs in my chest as I read. New lead in hunt for city killer. Police still searching for clues in last month's murder of a city man in a Leith public house disclosed that they had received a tip-off from an anonymous caller which yielded promising information. They appealed to the caller to get back in touch. On the Thursday before the Easter holiday, Edinburgh man Gary Chisholm, 38, was found bleeding to death on the floor of a Leith pub by the owner, Charles Winters, 52. Mr Winters had been downstairs in his cellar, changing the barrel when he heard shouts and a scream from the bar. He ran up to find Mr Chisholm lying with his throat cut on the floor of the empty pub and saw two youths aged between 15 and 20 fleeing from the scene. He went to Mr Chisholm's aid, but it was too late. On the new information, investigating officer D.I. Douglas Gilman said, It's true that we have received some additional information on this case, which may or may not be of use to us at this point in time. We are appealing for a male caller who phoned on Tuesday evening to get back in touch. Meanwhile, the victim's grieving family endorsed the police calls for members of the public to come forward. His sister, Mrs Janice Newman, 34, said, Gary was a great guy who didn't have a bad bone in his body. I can't understand how anybody could be covering up for the monster who killed my brother. If anybody has any information about this case, the number to contact is 0131 989 7173. That's fucking shite. That's the first thing they tell you in the nick. If the police start doing that, they're fucking desperate. It's just their way of putting the fucking heat on. Then I starts thinking about that cunt's second prize. About how the fucking cunt's no been in touch. That fucking pish heed mooth, gabbing shite, another fucking so-called mate. Fucking God! Know that I believe in that religion shite. These cunts have caused more bother than fucking nonces over in Ireland and that. And it's been proved that they priest cunts are the biggest fucking nonces out of the lot. So the whole fucking thing all fits together when you think about it. That Murphy's fucking deed. That's the problem with some cunts, but they never just fucking take the time to fucking well sit down and think about things. No fucking brains. Kate comes in. After she's made the tea and put the burn down, she starts washing her hair. Now she's blow drying it. Then you can what she wants to wash her fucking hair for when she's staying in. Maybe it's for the morn. For her shift at that fucking clay shop. I bet there's some cunt working there or in some of the other shops in that fucking centre that's got their eye on her. Some fucking wide cunt that thinks they're it. One of the pretty boy, fanny rat types like sick boy. Cunts with no fucking conscience that'll just yeas a lassie. As long as she's no got her fucking eye on the likes of him. That gets us thinking. Mind what happened with you and me when we first got together, I goes. She looks up at us, clicks off the dryer. What do you mean, she says. Mine, in bed, and that. 
Now she's looking at us like she kens what I'm talking about. That means she thinks about it and all. That was ages ago, Frank. You were just out of jail. It doesn't matter, she goes, screwing up her face a bit. No, no, it doesn't. But it fucking matters to me what cunts ken about it. You've no said now to any cunt about that, have you? She pulls out a fag and lights it up. What? Of course no. That's between you and me. It's nobody's business. Too right, I goes. You've no said now, but have you? No. No even to that fucking Evelyn. Ah, sir. Before she answers, I goes, "'Cause I ken what happens when birds get together. "'Yous talk, eh? "'Aye, yous fucking day. "'You can tell this has got her fucking well thinking. "'She'd better fucking no be lying to me, no for her sake. "'No about that bit, Frank. "'That's private. "'And all that was ages ago. "'I never even think about it. "'Oh, so she doesn't even think about it. Doesn't he even think about the fact that she spent two weeks kipping up with a boy that couldn't he fuck her? Like fuck she doesn't he think about it. So he's didn't he fucking well talk then, you and that fucking Evelyn, and that other fucking mate of yours, her with the fucking hair. Rona, she goes, all weary. Fucking Rona. You're trying to fucking well tell us that you's didn't he fucking well talk about your fellies, like... Her eyes have went all wide like she's feared. What's she fucking well got to be feared about, but? Aye, we talk, she goes. But no about that sort of thing, likes. No about what? No about intimate stuff. Stuff that goes on in bed and that. I looks her right in the eye. So ye didn't he talk about stuff that goes on in bed, like? No to your mates. Of course no. Where is this, Frank? What's wrong? She asks. I'll tell her what the fuck's wrong, all right. Right then. What about the time when our bunch of us were out doing the black swan? Mind of that time. That Evelyn was there and her with the hair. What's it you call the young piece again? Rona, she says, all worried. But Frank... I snap my fingers. Rona, that's the in. Right now. See that cunt you were way before me? The cunt I fucking panelled up the tune? I asks, and her eyes go wider. I mind we were in the pub that time, the Black Swan, and you says that he was shite in bed anyway. That's what you fucking well says about the boy that time, man. Frank, th- this is silly. I points at her. Answer the fucking question. Did you fucking well say that, or did you no fucking well say it? Aye, but I was just saying that because I was relieved to be away from him. I was relieved to have you. Relieved to fucking well have me. Relieved to be away from that cunt. So you were just fucking saying it for effect? To impress me and your fucking mates? Aye, that's it. She nearly sings out, like that's her off the hook. Doesn't he fucking realise that she's just fucking catching herself out with all that crap? Just like all the cunts that can't keep their fucking mouth shut. Just talking herself into a deeper fucking hole. Right. So then it wasn't he true. He wasn't he fucking shite in bed. He was brilliant. He was much fucking better than me. Is that the fucking truth then now, is it? Now it's like she's just about fucking greeting. No, no. I mean, it doesn't even matter what he was like in bed. I was just saying this because I hated him, because I was glad to be rid of him. It doesn't even matter what he was like in bed. I gives a wee smile at that. So, you were just saying it because it was fucking hour, because yous were fucking history. Aye. She's talking fucking shite. It doesn't add up. So what happens if we split up? If we're fucking history? He just starts saying they things about me. Ruin every fucking pub in Leith. That's it then, eh? No, no, it's no like that. 
I get a fucking well telt. Better fucking no be. Cause see if you ever breathe a word of that, there'll be no fucking well left of you after it. There'll be no fucking trace that you ever fucking existed. Right? She fucking well looks through to the bairns room and then looks back at me. Then she bursts into tears. She thinks I'm going to hurt her fucking bairn like I'm some kind of nonce cunt. Look, I goes. Didn't he greet, Kate? Come on. Look, I didn't mean it, I says. And I'm out and I've got my arm runner and I'm gone. It's just that there's a lot of people that hates us, Ken. Some cunts have been saying things behind my back and that. And I've been getting stuff. Stuff through the post. Didn't he give them weapons? That's all I'm fucking well saying. Didn't he give them weapons to use against us? And she's got a hood of me, and she's saying, Nobody will hear a bad word about you for me, Frank, cause you're nice to me, and you dunna hit me, but please dunna make us fear it like that, Frank, cause he used to do that, and I can't live like that, Frank. You're no like him, Frank. He was rubbish. I sit up straight, and pull her heed into my chest. It's all right, I goes, but I'm thinking, you didn't fucking well ken me at all, hen. But I can feel my heat starting to nip and my fucking heart starting to beat hard. I'm thinking about them all. Second prize with his loose mouth. Lex of that cunt Renton and fucking scruffy Murphy. Aye, that cunt was lucky he didn't he fucking well get it good. Still fucking well, mate. Trying to fucking set me up. That's thinking like a fucking nonce. He was fucking lucky. And that cunt seems to ken about that chizzy nonce and all. I'll find out where he kens all that shit for and beat it out of him. Thinks cause we go back that'll save him. Well, it fuck save him. No fucking way am I going back inside, but that'll be the fucking day. But I'll have to watch my step here. It's like every cunt kens, and even though I ken myself, it's just my fucking mind playing tricks on us. You just ken that they're all starting to close in, and I'm stroking Kate's hair, but I'm tensing up, and I need to get the fuck out of here, because I can't be held responsible for what I might do. So I sits up and tells her that I'm going out to watch the fitba. Right, she goes, looking out at the telly as if to say, you can watch it just as easy here. I know it's the screen. It's better doing the pub with the boys. You need to get the fucking atmosphere. She thinks about this for a while, then goes, Aye, it'll do you good, Frank. It's about time you got out instead of just sitting in that chair. I'm trying to think what the fuck she means by that. Maybe it does look fucking suspicious staying in all the time. But I had that wee Philip cunt screwing a house in Barton for us. Gave the cunt another two so of his bike for his trouble. I should get out, but... Mind you, she's awfully fucking keen to get us out. She can't go out because of the bairn. But she can have some cunt up, though. You just having a quiet night, aye? Aye. No having no cunt run? That fucking Rona? No. No having that Melanie hang out run? She's doing leith all the time. No, I'm... Just staying in and reading my book, she goes, showing us this book. Reading fucking books? They're all shy. Just put ideas in cunts' heads. Have a nae cunt run at all? No. Right, see you then, I goes, flinging on my jacket and heading out into the cold. Just as well that nae cunts come and run. Cunts let sick boy. I ken the way his mind works. Saying to that fucking Melanie, you must have plenty tidy wee mates for fucking game to be filmed getting rode by. Fucking! I fucking punched the wall in the stair. Cunt Ken what he'd fucking well get if he ever tried that. On the way down to the boozer, I sees that cunt June gone along the walk, and it makes it like I'm crossing the road after her. I'll gee the cunt restraining order, cheeky fucking cunt. I wouldn't you go within twenty five fucking yards of that sow? All I'm doing is trying to fucking tell her it was Murphy and Sickboy's fucking fault 
getting all fucking mixed up. But the cunt turns and runs down the road. I shouts after her to fucking stop, so as I can explain, but the daft cunt's away. Fuck that dozy whore. I snap on the fucking moby and remind the cunts to get down there, Melly and Larry, because I ken that Malky will be there already, hudding up the fucking bar. Malky the fucking Alky. Sure enough, the cunt is there, and Larry and Nelly are any fucking far behind. Thing is, it's the fucking same vibe in here. Every cunt seems to gee the look that fucking well goes, I I ken you, you cunt. And this is mates that we're talking about here, or so-called fucking mates. We're watching the Hibs match on Sky. Good fucking run they're on now, and they never fucking lose in Sky. That Zitelli scores with a Barry overheat kick. 3-1, too fucking easy. Everybody still seems to be talking about you on beast cunt, but... And there's me just sitting there, wishing that they could talk about something else. But at the same time, I'm fucking loving it. I bet you it was one of the young team. They boys dripping with the Sovies, Malky goes. The bastard probably touched one of them up or something like that when he was a wee laddie. He's filled out and grown up now, and it's bang! Take that, you clarty beast cunt! Maybe, I goes, looking over at Larry. Oh, he's got a big daft smile on his face. Fuck knows what that cunt say fucking happy about. Now the cunt tells everybody a fucking joke. This grocer in Fife is in his shop and it's freezing cold and he's standing over the electric fire. A wife he comes in, looks at the counter and goes to him, Is that your Ayrshire bacon? The grocer looks at her and says, No, I'm just warming my hands. I didn't get that cunt sense of humour at all. Malky's the only cunt that laughs. Nelly turns round and says, See if I met the cunt that did that fucking beast. I'd buy the cunt a fucking pint right now. Funny. The way he says it makes us want to shout. Get your fucking hand in your pocket then, you cunt, cos he's right fucking here. But mates, or nay mates, the fewer people that can the better. I keep thinking about second prize. See, if he's gone back in the pish and started blabbing, Larry's still smiling away, and I'm getting nipped here. So I goes bend the bog and has a fucking line. When I comes back, I sits myself down, and some cunt's got another round of lager in. Malky points at the full glass. That's yours there, Frank. I nods to the cunt and takes a gulp, looking over the top of the pint at Larry, who is staring at us with that fucking daft smirk on his face. What the fuck are you looking at? I ask the cunt. He shrugs his shoulders. No, he goes. Fucking well just sitting there looking at us like he kens everything that's going on in my fucking head. Nelly's picked it up as well as I hands him the rapid ching under the table. What the fuck's up here, he asks. I nods over at Larry. Cunt's just fucking well sitting there with a daft fucking look in his face, staring at me like I'm some fucking daft cunt, I goes. Larry shakes his head and raises his palms up and goes, What? As Nelly's eyes go all hard. Malky looks around, across at the bar. Sandy Ray and Tommy Folds are drinking up there, and there's a couple of wee cunts on the pool table. So what are you fucking saying then, Larry, eh? I ask him. I'm not saying no, Franco, Larry goes, looking all innocent. I'm just thinking about that goal and he nods to the screen behind us as a replay comes on. So I'm thinking, all right, I'll let it go, but sometimes that cunt can be too fucking wide for his ain good. Right, well, then he fucking sit looking at us with that daft fucking wee smile in your face, like some fucking dippet cunt. If you've got anything to say to us, just fucking well say it. Larry shrugs and turns away, as Nelly heads for the bogs. That's no bad ching. Nout but the best off his handy. For me it's nout, but the best anyway. Cunts ken better than to sell me gear that's cut to fuck. Your mate sick boy's some cunt, eh, Franco? The dirty movies and that. Larry grins. Then he mentioned that cunt's name to me. 
cunt's got a few wee fucking hairies getting rowed upstairs in his pub and the cunt thinks he's a fucking big Hollywood producer. Like that fucking Steven Spielberg cunt or whatever they call the fucker. Nelly comes back for the bog and Malky looks at him and goes, Where's fucking shout, is it? But Nelly ignores him. Cause you can tell he's all that way when you've been in the bogs thinking about something and you want to talk to every cunt about it. Ken, what gets on my fucking wick? He goes. Then before any cunt can say what he says, every cunt here's done time. And he takes a big supper lager. A bit's dripped onto his blue Ben Sherman, but he doesn't notice. Clarty fucking cunt. We're all looking at each other and nodding away. Ken, we never does time. You can, he looks at me. I can, he points at his cell. You can, he looks at Malky. And you can, he says to Larry, where his face breaks into that fucking smile again. And the thing is, I'm thinking about that big cunt Lexo, the first cunt that came into my mind right away, but nearly surprises us by going, Alec Doyle. What's he done? A year? Eighteen months? Fuck all. That cunt leads a charmed life. Malky looks all seriously at Nelly. So what are you saying then? Are you trying to say that Doyle's a grass? Nelly's eyes are set all that hard way. All I'm saying is that the cunt leads a charmed life. Larry's face goes all serious. You're no wrong, Nelly, he says softly. Fucking sure and I'm no wrong, Nelly says, looking annoyed to fuck. Malky turns round to me and asks, Who do you reckon then, Frank? I look around the table at them all, and right into their eyes, Nelly's and all. Doyle's I was been all right in my fucking book. You didn't just call some cunt a grass unless you can back it up. And that means we facts. We hard fucking facts. Nelly doesn't like that. But the cunt's no saying now. Nah. He's no happy at all. You've got to watch that cunt. Because he can just fucking well kick off like that. But I'm fucking well watching him all right. Good point, Frank. Larry goes, nodding away all sly. But Nelly's got a point in all, he says taking the rap for Nelly and going to the bogs. I never call any cunt of grass, Nelly says to me as Larry heads off. But think about what I says, he goes, then turns and he nods to Malky. Aye, Larry had better think about things than all. Fucking stirring cunt. Or there was something going on with that cunt, and he'd better make sure I didn't fucking well find out what it is. Well, we're all wired on the fucking ching, and we opt for moving on. We have one in the vine, and a couple in swannies. It's still the real leith down here, but everything is fucking well changing. What gets me is what they've done to the walk-in. Can he believe that? I had some great nights in there. We hit another couple of boozers, then end up back where we started. That wee Philip cunt's hanging about and all. Here, in this fucking pub. Then he want that wee cunt and his mates hanging about a boozer I use. You, fucking blow, I tells him. Eh? I'm waiting on Curtis, he's coming down with the motor, he goes. Then he says, all fucking hopeful, Eh, hey, you couldn't get us some coke, could you? I looks at the wee cunt. Where are you getting the fucking dosh for ching? Wolfie Curtis. Aye, that fucking well figures. That fucking crew of sick boys. They cunts always seem to be in the dosh. A couple of people have said that Renton's been seen about again, up the tune in that. See if sick boys seen him and hasn't he fucking tell us. But this wee Philip cunt's still hanging about. I know it's over to Sandy Ray, where he's sitting with Nelly at the bar. Larry and Malky are pished playing the bandit. Sandy comes over, sorts the wee cunt out with a couple of gram wraps. The big gangly wee cunt with the tadger comes in. Then they go outside into the motor and I hear it tearing up the road. 
Nelly comes over, and we're looking across at Larry and Malky. That wily cunt's been winding us up all fucking night, Nelly says. Aye, I goes. I'll tell ye, Franco, he's lucky he's your fucking mate, or I'd have fucking well panelled the cunt by now. He looks across at Larry. Fucking wide airs. Don't you let that stop you, I tells him. So Nelly gets up and walks over and smashes Larry's head off the fruit machine a couple of times. Then he turns him round and fucking melts the cunt of beauty. Larry goes down and Nelly stomps him. Malky puts his hand on Nelly's shudder and goes, Enough! Nelly stops and Larry's being helped up by Malky, but gets him outside. He looks around at Nelly and says something, raises a wasted hand and tries to point the finger, but Malky's dragging him out the pub. Fucking widow, Nelly says, looking at me. I'm thinking, me and Nelly's mates, but it's going to be him and me soon, that's for sure. The cunt was fucking asking for it, all right, I know it's. Malky soon comes back in. Stuck him in a taxi with a tenor, tell him to get the fuck. No rang with him, just a bit fucking dazed, eh? Is he giving out fucking lip? Nelly asks. Because he can have a square go any time he wants. Aye, watch the cunt bit, Nelly, Malky goes. Because he's a fucking blade merchant and he never forgets. I don't he fucking well forget either, Nelly goes. But you can see that he's fucking thinking about that. But in the morn, when he wakes up, it'll be, Oh fuck, I had too much ching in that and I ended up doing Larry. Because the likes of that cunt needs ching and a few babies to do that. That's the difference between me and him. Sixty-eight. Scam number 18,751. Every time I go up to see Nicky at her place, he's always there, hanging about, sniff around that Diane like a lovesick fool. It's bizarre us seeing two lassies who share the same flat. A bit like the old days. Now the rent boy's lying on the couch, waiting on Miss Diane getting ready, reading a book about pornography and sex workers, wherever they are. He's found the right bird. I can imagine them sitting around intellectually discussing fucking, but never actually doing any. I offered him and his new minge a chance of some action, whether the real players, and he says, I love my girlfriend. Why do I want any of that shit for? Oh, excuse me, Mr. High and Shitey. He props that silly ginger head up on his elbow. Listen, Si, I'm looking to get in touch with second prize. Have you seen him around? I'm quite aghast at this. Second prize is to be avoided at all costs. Why in the name of suffering a fuck would you want to see him? Rent sits up, leans forward, then seems to consider, then decides again, Slang. You can see the wheels moving. I want to sort him out with the cash. From that time back in London. I've sorted everybody out now. Well, except him. And you know who. Renton is an idiot. Any grudging respect I once had for the man is diminishing rapidly. Me, ripped off by a mug like that. No, he was simply a desperate, foolish junkie who locked out once. You're fucking mad. It's a waste of cash. Just write a cheque made payable to tenant Caledonian breweries. Rent stands up as Diane and Nicky come through. I've heard he's clean. They say he's a Bible basher. I can't see it. Try the mission or the lodging houses or the churches. They all gather up at Scrubbers Close or the religious jakeys, do they know? I have to admit that Diane looks sexy, though. Obviously not in Nicky's league. Well, she's going out with Renton. Looking gorgeous, ladies, I smile. We must have been good little boys in a previous life to deserve them, eh, mate? A smirk at Rents. Renton responds with a slightly pained look and goes over to Diane and kisses her. Right then, you fit? Aye, she says. And as they leave, I shout, As a butcher's knife! Use the evidence of your eyes, Renton! I get no response. That Diane chick does not like me at all, and she's turning Rents against me. I look at Nicky. That pair seem a real item, I observe, struggling to keep the grace in my voice. Oh, God, she goes all dramatically. 
They are just so in L O V E. I feel like telling her, watch your friend round that slimy, cold skinned North European rattlesnake. But it seems a spiritless ploy. One must strive to be graceful in gracement. Nicky's been so full of herself since the canyons, sweeping round theatrically like she's an old style Hollywood star. It's been noticed. Terry started to refer to her as Nicky Fuller Shit. So besotted by herself is she that she elects to change again, putting on a blue and black number I haven't seen before. It's not quite as fetching as what she's just changed out of, but I feign massive enthusiasm just to prevent us being here all fucking night. She's wittering on about can. God knows who we'll meet. Me. So I nip into that Diane's room and have a sniff around. I see this report thing she'd been working on, and I read a bit. With increasing consumerism, the sex industry, like all others, is now catering for specialist market needs. While it is true that there is still a link between poverty, drug abuse and on-street prostitution, this represents a very small part of what is now one of the biggest and most diverse industries in the UK. Nonetheless, our popular images of sex workers are still largely formed by the street corner tart stereotype. What the fuck are they teaching them at the uni now? Degrees in the theory of whoring. I should get up there myself and claim my honorary doctorate. We go out for a drink at the city cafe, and I spy Terry trying to chap a student barmaid. It seems that he's adopted the place as his haunt. I go to signal Nicky that we should get out and over TH1, but she hasn't noticed, and now Lawson's caught her eye. Sicky and Nicky! he shouts, then turns to the barmaid. Bev, whatever my two gold old buddies want, he smiles and grabs Nicky's ass. Solid as a fucking rock doll! You've been working it. No even a Tracy overhang. Actually, I've been rather lazy lately, she says in that dozy stone away. What's she fucking doing letting him pour like that? Next she'll be letting him thrust his knob up her twat as he says, Hmm, firm vaginal walls. Been doing pelvic exercises? I'm looking at Terry as if to say, This is my fucking bird loss in you onanistic cunt. He doesn't even see me. Well, it doesn't show on the body, I tell you that. I just want to get down on my hands and knees and worship all that arse of yours. So if this lucky cunt here, he deigns to give me a cursory nod, gives you grief, you can hear to call. Nicky smiles, squeezes Terry's love handles and says, Knowing you, Terry, you'd want to do a lot more than just worship. Too right. And on that subject, what about a stag night? I was at the hospital and I got the complete discharge. And your kicks? I ask. Must have been Ward 45, the clap clinic. So I'm ready, willing and able, he says, ignoring me again. Well, Terry, we've got a wee problem. I explain about the news and how I want to keep a low profile until the movie comes out. Have to be my flat then, I suppose. Still, let's drink to can. That'll be a cracker. Please for yous. He smiles in a way that chills me. Then he puts an arm on my shoulder. Sorry I took the straw parlour, mate. Just a bit jealous. Still, you can't grudge an old buddy success. Couldn't he have done it without you, tell? I say, quite gobsmacked by his magnanimity. Good of you to be so graceful and grace, mate, about the whole deal. It's purely down to money, mate. It costs a fortune to take somebody to can, even for a few days. I'll see you right when the cash comes in, but... Nay, bother. I've got one or two wee things I need to do around the on time anyway. Rab's no bothered either. Talked to him the other day. Too busy with a bear in his college and that, eh? How is Roberto? I ask. Seems fine. Couldn't he be dealing with a life of boring domesticity myself, but... He waxes. Tried it once. Nah, wasn't it for me? Me neither, I concede. I'm temperamentally unsuited for the long haul. Responsibility, I can't handle. In fact, I thrive on it in sustained bursts, but no for the long haul. He's conned us all from time to time. Nicky rumbles contentedly, the drink going to her head, along with the fucking dope she smoked all day long. A stoner. And she wonders how she never made it as a gymnast. And we love him for it still. Well, sometimes, Terry says. Yes, why is he like that? Why is he so manipulative? I think it's growing up in a household full of doting women. Yes, it's the Italian thing. He can bring out a dormant maternal instinct in women she says loudly. Nicky is starting to grate. There's no two ways about it. I don't know this T 
tendency to psychoanalyse wears thin after a while. My ex-wife did all that, and for a time I used to like it. It made me feel as if she cared. Then I realised that it was just something she did to everybody. A habit. After all, she was a Hampstead Jewess whose family worked in the media. So what could you expect? So eventually it vexed me. And now Nicky rankles too. Now I'm starting to find reasons not to be with her. I know the danger signs. I want to start to look at uglier, less poised, less graceful, less intelligent birds, but with a massive horn. I'm realising that it's only a matter of time before I jettison Nicky for somebody I'll hate in five minutes. And she's not as good a fuck as she thinks, with all that gymnastics shit. She's a lazy cow for one thing, always fast asleep, lying in all day, a typical fucking student, while I'm up with a lark. Never was one for sleeping. Two or three hours a night does me fine. I'm sick of waking up in the night with a hard-on and having to poke a warm sack of spuds. But she looks so beautiful. Why is it I'd rather do almost anything right now than take her home and fuck her? It's only been a few months. Have I had my fill of her already? Is my threshold really that low? Surely not. If that's the case, I'm fucking well doomed. We go back to hers, and she has me looking at some pictures in one of those near wank boy men's mags, the ones that have become indistinguishable from the top shelvers. This other ex-gymnast chick, that Carolyn Pavitt, she's on the cover. The one that Nicky knew. The one that she's obsessed with. She's ugly, I dismissively remark. It's just because she was in the Olympics and she's on the telly that a lot of guys want to ride her. A trophy fuck, that's all. You'd fuck her though. If she walked through that door now, you'd ignore me and be all over her, she says with real bile in her voice. I can't handle this bullshit. She's fucking jealous. Accusing me of having designs on somebody I can't remember consciously seeing a fucking image of until she stuck it in my face a few seconds ago. I get up and make to leave. Get control, I muse as I depart. She slams the door shut behind me and I can hear a quite impressive string of curses from the other side of it. Sixty-nine. Polis. That Donnelly cunt's got a chib, and he's tearing into me away, and I can't even lift my hands up to hit him. It's like they're weighed down, like somebody's hoding them or they're made of fucking lead, and now that beast cunt, that chizzy's coming for me, and I try and kick out, and he's going, I love you, Chavy. Thanks, Chavy. And I'm going... Get away from me, you fucking beast cunt! I'll fucking kill you! But I still can't move. My fucking arms and this cunt's coming, and there's a banging. I'm awake in bed, and her heed's in my arm, and it's just a fucking dream. But that fucking banging's still going on, and I, it's a knocking on the door. And she's waking up, and I goes, Go and get that. And she gets up. Oh, sleepy likes. But when she comes back, she's all fucking alert and worried. And she goes in a fucking whisper, Frank, it's the polis for you. The fucking polis? Some cunt's fucking blabbed about the beast. Murphy, maybe that cunt died in the hospital or that fucking Alison grassed us up. Second fucking prize. They all cunts. Right, I'm just getting ready. You stole the cunts, I tell her. And she goes back out. I pulls on my clays as quick as I can. Aye, that cunt second prize is gabbed about the beast. Thou shalt not fucking kill us, some shite. Or Murphy, he seemed to fucking ken the lot. Cunt, 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 cunt! I looks at the drop for the windy. I could get down that drain pipe into the back and through another stair. But there might be mere of them in the van outside. No, if I dare run her, I'll be fucked. Could still brass it out. Get Donaldson, the fucking lawyer. Where's that fucking Moby? I reaches into my jacket pocket. The Moby's deed. I never fucking charged the cunt up. Fuck! There's a tap on the door. Mr. Begby! It's the fucking polis, all right. Aye. I don't know. If they can't see anything, I'm saying now. I'm right on the fucking phone to Donaldson. I take a deep breath and walk out. There's two coppers. A guy with ears that stick out under the hat, and a lassie. Mr. Begby, the lassie goes. Aye. We're here about an incident in Lorne Street earlier this week. I'm thinking, Chizzy wasn't near Lorne Street. 
Your ex-wife, Miss June Taylor, made a complaint against you. You are aware that there is an interim restraining order which has been served on you until this can be dealt with in court. The policeman bud goes, all fucking snooty. Eh, aye. I look at this bit of paper she hands us. This is a copy of the conditions of that order. You should have been issued with one. To remind you of its contents, this police bird now sort of sings. You are expressly forbidden to make any contact with Ms. Taylor. The other cop butts in. Ms. Taylor claims that you approached her in Leith Walk, shouted at her and pursued her down Lawn Street. Thank fuck! It was just that cunt June. I'm fucking that relieved here. I just starts laughing, and they're looking at us like I'm a fucking dipstick. Then I says, Aye, sorry, officer. I just ran into her in the street, and I wanted to apologise for the way I behaved to her. They tell her it was all a misunderstanding, eh? I got the wrong end of the stick. That's how I acted over the top. Mind you, I says, lifting up my shirt and showing the wound. She chibbed me with a knife. And she's got the fucking cheek to complain. Kate's nodding away and she goes, That's right, she stabbed Frank. Look at that. I never complain, but, I shrugs. For the sake of the bairns, Ken. The lassie policeman goes, Well, if you wish to complain about your wife, you can. In the meantime, you have to comply with those terms and keep away from her. I don't worry about that. I just laughs. The other cop with the sticky new ears tries to be all fucking hard, like he's trying to impress the fucking lassie policeman. This is serious, Mr. Begby. You could be in a lot of trouble if you harass your ex-wife. Do I make myself clear? I'm thinking that I should just look this fucking dippet streaky pish in the eye, watch them water, and him look away as I can he would. But I didn't want them tagging us as a fucking white cunt and pitting heat on. So I just smiles and goes, I'll keep well away from her. Didn't you worry about that, officer? I wish you had been here to tell us that ten years ago. Would have saved a lot of soapy bubble. They just keep looking all serious at us. I mean, you try and have a fucking sense of humour, but some miserable cunts just didn't well fucking get it. I'll stay away from that June, all right. But there's some cunts... I'll no be keeping away from you. 70. Driving. Ali's been great, man. It has to be said, up every day. We tell the wee boy that I was in a car crash and Uncle Frank saved us. She went round and spoke to Joe, Franco's bra, and tell him that there was no prospect of anybody grassing up about anything. She'd go without saying, but Franco's that para. I tell Ali to take the money and stick it in her bank account. It's for her and the bear. She can spend it how she wants to. I've got a broken jaw. It's all wired up and I pure can't eat any solids. Three cracked ribs, a broken nose and a fracture of the femur. And I've also got severe bruising and 18 stitches in the head. It is like I've been in a car crash. I'm getting out soon and Ali's talking about coming back. I'm pure no wanting Hernandez Rundes with Big B on the warpath. I've got to sort things out with him first. It's a mess, a total mess, but the weird thing is, it did teach us something, man. I feel more focused now. I tell Ali in my soft, dark voice, I want you back more than anything, but you're right, I've got to sort myself out, start to learn to cope. So is that I do things around the house and cook and all that sort of stuff when you come back. I'd like to be able to come round and see you and the wee man first, like say, take you on a hot date and that. She laughed and kissed my battered face. <laughs> That'd be great. You can't go home on your own, no, Danny, no like that. Ah, it's all sort of superficial, but I always thought Franco was a bit of a pussy cat, really. I mumble through the wired Dennis Law. Ali has to go and get the wee man, but when I get discharged, my ma and her Shona and Liz are here, and they get us home. They make a fire up and some grub, and then they get ready to leave us. Oh, sorry, reluctant, like, say. This is silly, Danny, Liz says. Come and stay at ours. Aye, come home with me, son, my ma says. 
Nah, I'm sound, I tell them. No worries. They head away. And as it happens, it was a pure good call, because later on that night there was a rap at the door. No way I'm going to answer it. You fucking well in there, Murphy? The cat shouts, opening the letterbox. Even though I'm sitting with the lights off, I can pure feel the eyes of evil scanning down the passageway. Better fucking no be. You see if you are, and you're not answering the fucking door. I'm shitting it, but I'm thinking that's Frank or... What would happen if I did open the door? He doesn't stick around, but... I sleep in the chair, because I got comfy, but after a while I stagger through to my bed and I don't wake up until the next morning when the door goes again. I think it's him back again, but it isn't. Spud! Are you there? It's Curtis. I open the door, half expecting to see Begby standing with a knife at the pair gadget's throat. Hey, all right, Curtis, man. I'm uh, pure lying low now. Is that Begby, eh? I ken that because Philip sort of hangs about with him. No, man, it was some bad dudes that I owed some dosh to. Franco was the one that sorted it out for me, likes, I tell him. I mean, he kens that I'm a crap liar, but he kens that I'm trying to protect him to keep him out of things. So, I goes, I hear you're off to that Cannes Film Festival, no bad, eh? Uh, aye, he goes, oh, enthusiastic. Mind, it's not a real yin, just a porn yin, he adds. But good luck to the boy. Curtis is a good wee cat. I mean, the boy was up regular at the hospital, Ken. He's been having the time of his life with that knob of his, but he doesn't forget his buddies, and that says a lot to me, likes. Too many people just forget where they came from, like sick boy. Aye, he thinks he's a big success now. But I'd better not say no about that, because Curtis likes sick boy. Some life he's got now, though, shagging good-looking lasses and getting paid for it. No bad deal when you think about it. I mean, there's worse ways to earn a living, it's got to be said. Then he goes, Come out, I've got a motor. Come on for a drive, it's no chore either now. So we're driving down the A1 to Haddington in this old car. And I'm telling him to go faster than he does. And I'm thinking I could just clip off the seatbelt and slam my foot on the brakes and fly through that windscreen. But with my luck I'd just be paralysed for life or something. It wouldn't be fair to Curtis. And I pure want to sort myself out because I've got Ali and Andy. Or at least a chance of getting back with him. Dostoevsky. Insurance scams. What a lot of nonsense likes. We goes out to this wee country pub. Only really a few miles for Leith, but a different world altogether. Couldn't hack it out here, but man. Sometimes I think the three of us in a wee cottage, how peachy that would be, but then I realised that I'd be bored. No way Andy and Ali, but the lack of general stimulus likes it. I borrow Curtis's mobile phone and a bell rents. Arranging to meet him the night in a pub up the grass market. I can't see Begby in the grass market. And we both pure than he want to see Begby, can seventy one Whores of Amsterdam part ten Spud looks in a bad way, his jaws swollen like a second head trying to grow out his face, and he's exhausted climbing the stairs to Gav's. He still won't talk about who's done him, just vague mutterings through a broken jaw about rages he owed money to. Sarah looks particularly shocked at the extent of the poor cunt's injuries. If it was Begby, then he's no mellowed, not one bit. Gav and Sarah come out with us for a drink, then head away to the cinema. Everybody vanishes when I show up, he says in a small muffled voice. Must be my personality. Still, it's good that we're in touch again, eh, Mark? He chunters, all eager and hopeful. I hate to burst what little bubble he has, but I lift my pint, put it down and take a deep breath. Listen, Spud, I'm not going to be sticking around here much longer. Cause you beg me? He asks, life suddenly fusing into his tired eyes. I partly... I concede. But no, just him. I want to move away. With Diane. She's been in Edinburgh all her life and she fancies a change. 
Spud looks sadly at me. Right then, I'll need you to bring Zappa back to me before you go. Will you do that for us, Mark? It's hard to manage with a cat carrier with the ribs all bandaged and just the one arm. He nods wretchedly at his sling. I nae bother, I tell him. But there's something you can do for me, and all. Aye? Spud says in a manner that indicates he's not used to being thought of as able to do something for anybody. Tell me where I can find second prize. He looks at me like I'm a fucking raj, which I suppose I am, the shite I've let myself get mixed up in already. Then he smiles and says, OK. We have a few mere scoops and I drop Spud off back at his without getting out the taxi. Then I head back up to Diane's and we go to bed. We make love and lie in the next day, doing more of the same. After a while I become aware that she's a bit tense and distracted. Eventually, she says, I have to get up and go over this dissertation just one more time. I reluctantly go out and head over to Gav's to give her peace. By fuck, it's a pissing wet and cold day. Summer's round the corner, my arse. Conditions are still fucking alpine. My mobile vibrates inside my coat pocket. It's sick boy, and he's oozing suspicion when I tell him that I'm not coming out to Cannes straight away. I inform him that Miz will be there anyway, and I need to go to the dam first and sort a few things out of the club. When I get to Gav's, he tells me that he ran into sick boy and Nicky in town and invited them up for a meal with me and Diane. My face falls at the prospect, and I doubt whether Diane will be chuffed. But when I catch up with her, she's okay about it. Probably because Nicky's her mate. When we meet up, sick boy's on his best behaviour, or as close as he gets to it. He's flirting with Sarah in such an obvious way, but Nicky doesn't seem to mind. She's just making a fuss at Gav, who looks bemused like he's been set up for a foursome, which, with these two, is probably the case. After a bit, sick boy collars me in the kitchen. I need you in can, he wails. He's always on about trying to save money on the trip. The Doss cunt can start with me. I can't he just up and leave. All my stuff's in Holland, and I'm taking it. I don't want Catherine getting her hands on it, which she will if I'm no lively. He tuts and hisses better than Deirdre in Coronation Street. So when will you be out then? I'll be in the south of France by Thursday. You better. I booked the fucking room, he snaps. Then his eyes go wide in appeal as he swirls his brandy around in the glass. Come on, Mark. This is a moment, mate, all our life. We've been waiting for this. Leaf boys and can, for fuck's sake. We're quoted. What a fucking experience it'll be. That's why I wouldn't fucking miss it for the world, I tell him. I've just got to sort things out with Catherine. She's pretty volatile. I don't want my stuff trashed. And I can't just leave Martin in the lurch like that. Sorry, mate, I know we've been running a club for seven years through thick and thin, but now my old buddy Simon's back on the scene and he wants me to produce porn flicks with him. He raises his hands and lowers his head as Sarah comes through with some dirty dishes. All right, all right. Seizing the high ground, I add, I've had a fucking life these last nine years. I can't just click it off like a fucking light switch because you deem me persona grata again as I watch Sarah trot out like she's walking on broken glass. He says something back and we bitch and bicker to an impasse before catching some mischief in each other's eyes and bursting out laughing. We can't do this anymore, Simon, I tell him. It was all right as young boys, but now we're getting to sound like a pair of old queens. Can you imagine us ten years on? I'd rather not, he says, looking genuinely ulcerated at the prospect. The only thing that can redeem us is A, having lots of money, and B, young chicks in tow. In your twenties you can do it on looks, your thirties and personality, but in your forties you need cash or fame. Simple fucking mathematics. Everybody thinks I'm aspirational, but I'm not. It's a maintenance thing with me. A kind of crisis management. It disturbs me, him opening up like this. Because under the nihilistic bravado, I can tell that the cunt's been absolutely honest. Can I take this scam away from him? It seems so harsh. But what would he have taken away from me if Begbie had found me? Nah, sick boy's a cunt. It's not that he's such a bad bastard. He's just 
ultra fucking selfish. When you swim with sharks, you only survive by being the biggest one. But he's strangely appreciative of my motivations, saying I was right to leave Britain. It's clapped out, and if you don't have wealth or money, you're a third-class citizen. America's the place, he argues. I should get over there, start my own church and take the piss out of those naive, gullible yanks. Nicky comes through and says to me, eyebrows arched, Simon and Kitchens, a bad combination. She regards him. You are behaving. In an exemplary manner, he says. But come on, Rents, let's join the body of the Kirk. We don't want to leave temps with all them chicks. We're back round the table, and sick boy Gav and I have an old-style argument about the lyrics to Roger Daltrey's Giving It All Away. It's I'd know better now, giving it all away, sick boy opines. No, Gav shakes his head. It's I know better now. I give the cunts a dismissive wave. Your different positions are just minor pedantic squabbles which don't change the essential meaning of the song. If you listen, really listen, you'll find it's I'm no better now. As in, not any better now. I'm just the same, I haven't learned anything. Bullshit, sick boy snorts. The song's about looking back with the benefit of hindsight and maturity. Aye, Gav agrees. Sort of, if I knew then what I know now, kind of thing. No, that's where you're both wrong, I argue. Listen to Daltrey's vocal, it's a lament, there's something defeated in it. The tale of a gad who's finally acknowledged his limitations. I'm no better now, because I'm the same fucked up cunt I always was. Sick boy seems suddenly hostile at this, enraged like it's something important. You don't even ken what the fuck you're talking about, Renton. He turns to Gav. Tell him, Gav, tell him. Our Mr Williamson seems to be taking this a little personally. The argument continues until Diane interrupts. How can you get so worked up over such trivial shite? She shakes her head and turns to Nicky and Sarah. I'd love to be able to spend just one day in their heads just to feel what it was like to have all that crap swimming round in there. And one of her hands brushes my brow as the other falls onto my thigh. One hour would suit me fine, Sarah maintains. Aye, sick boy ventures, now seeing the lunacy of it all and smiling at me. In the old days we had Begbie to say, that's a load of fucking shite and it's getting on my tits so shut the fuck up or you'll get your fucking mouths burst. Aye, sometimes too much democracy can be a killer, Gav laughs. This Begbie seems like a real character. I'd like to meet him. Nicky declares. Sick boy shakes his head. No, you wouldn't. I mean, he doesn't really like girls, he sniggers. And Gav and I find ourselves joining in. Nor boys, for that matter, I add, and we're pissing ourselves now. After a bit, Nicky starts on about Can, which Diane has told me is a fairly staple thing with her right now, and Sarah and Gav are getting spiky with each other. Diane and I take this as our cue to get away her saying something about needing to print out another copy of her thesis. Unfortunately, Nicky and Sick Boy elect to join us in the cab. That Sarah's fucking tidy, Sick Boy states. Gosh, isn't she? Nicky rasps, her face flushed and sweaty with drink. I suggested a foursome, but she wasn't into it. Sick Boy confirms my suspicions. I think Temps was a bit put out as well, he adds. Then he turns to Diane. I haven't asked you, Di, not because I don't fancy you, but because you come in a package, and I thought of rents and the buff. I'd actually confessed to her that the cunt had already sounded me out about it. She looks witheringly at him, and starts talking to Nicky, who seems pretty drunk. We get up the stairs and go to our separate rooms, and I can hear Nicky and Sicky, as Terry calls him, having a drunken argument. I start reading the latest draft of Diane's thesis as she goes to the bathroom. I can't understand a lot of it, which I take to be a good sign, but it looks, well, academic enough. Research evidence, references, footnotes, extensive bibliographies, etc. And it reads quite well. It seems excellent, I tell her as she comes in. I mean, as much as I know about these things, but it reads well in layperson's terms. It's a pass, but probably not a great one, she says, without any hint of despondency. 
We start talking about what she's going to do now that it's finished, and she kisses me and says, You mentioned lay persons. And she unzips me and pulls at my stiffening cock. Holding it firmly, she rubs her tongue over her lips. I'm going to do this, she tells me. Loads and loads and loads more of this. I'm thinking, we can't possibly do any more than we already are. We sleep through, and it's the cusp of the following afternoon before we wake up. I bring two mugs of tea back to bed, and decide it's time to tell Diane everything. The lot. I do. How much she knew, or had figured out, I'm not sure. But she doesn't seem too surprised. Then again, she never does. I'm getting dressed, pulling on a fleece and jeans as she sits up in bed. So you're going to find an alcoholic friend you haven't seen in nearly ten years and give him three thousand pounds in cash? Aye. Are you sure that you've thought this through? She inquires through a yawn as she stretches. <sighs> it's not often I agree with it, boy, but you might be doing the guy more harm than good giving him that sort of money all at once. It's his dosh. If he chooses to drink himself to death, then so be it, I tell her. But I know I'm only thinking of me, of my need to set the record straight. The cold seems to settle into the fabric of the city. It's like a disease the old place just can't quite shake off. The weather forever threatening to recede back into full-blown winter in the face of the cruel icy winds from the North Sea. The miles looking spooky, even though darkness has barely begun to fall. I trudge along the cobblestones and find the close. I move down the tight, narrow lane which opens up into a small, dark courtyard surrounded by towering old tenements. A tiny venal slopes down towards the new town. The courtyard is crowded with people. They're all listening to a bearded old gadge with wild, traumatised eyes preaching from the Bible. There's a lot of jakies here, but also plenty of AA and NA rehab cases, where the need for drug ingestion is replaced by the fervid fix of evangelical outpourings. After scanning the crowd for a bit, I see him, looking thinner, clean-shaven, but like a man in recovery from something, because that's it, the frozen state of being in recovery, that status the temperance movement sets in stone. It's Rab McNaughton, second prize, and I have to give him £3,000 in cash. I approach him warily. Second prize was close to Tommy, an old pal of ours who died of AIDS. He blamed me for getting Tommy on junk and even physically had a go once. The man always was endowed with quite an unequivocal nature. Sec. Robert! I quickly correct myself. He looks at me for a bit, registers me in brief contempt, then turns back to the preacher, his eyes burning devouring every word the man says as he mouths the appropriate amens. How's things? I prompt. What do you want? He asks, again momentarily engaging with me. I've got something for you, I tell him. The money I owe you. I put my hand into my coat pocket and feel the wad, thinking that this is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Second prize turns to face me. You can what you can do with it. You're evil. You, Begbie, that pornographer Simon Williamson, Murphy the junkie, you're all evil. You're killers, and you do the work of the devil. The devil lies doing in that port of Leith, and you're his workers. It's an evil place, he says, his eyes rolling to the sky. A baffled sensation between mirth and anger wells up inside of me and I have to fight the temptation to tell him that he's talking a load of shite. Look, I want to give you this. Just take it and I'll see you in the next life, I tell him, crushing the bundle of notes into his jacket pocket. A stout woman with curly hair and a thick Belfast accent comes up and says, What's wrong? What's wrong, Robert? Second prize pulls the wad from his pocket and brandishes it in front of my face. This, this is what's wrong. You think you can buy me off with this rubbish? 
You think you can buy my silence, you and Begby? Thou shalt not kill, he says, eyes burning. Then he screams in my face, shredding my nerves as he splatters out with slaver. Thou shalt not kill! He throws the money into the air and the notes swirl in the wind. The crowd suddenly realise what's happening. One dirt encrusted man in a filthy overcoat grabs a fifty pound note and holds it up to the light. A crusty dives onto the cobblestones and soon everybody's in a greed frenzy, ignoring the old preacher who, seeing the cash fluttering in the air, forgets his sermon and is rummaging around with the rest of them. I back away and grab a couple of fistfuls of notes and stick them in my pockets. A reason that I gave them to him, to do what he wanted to do, but if he opted for a poor out, then I was got to be right in. I head up the alley and out the close mouth, into the mile, reflecting that I've probably just wiped out half the JK population of the city and smashed up the wagon of every rehab case. I go back to Diane's and I see sick boys still there, all wet and wearing a towel wrapped around them. Can tomorrow, he smiles. I can't wait to catch you up, I tell him. It's a fucking bummer about the dam, but I have to do it. When's your flight? He tells me it's about eleven o'clock. So the next day, I arrange to share a cab with him and Nicky to the airport. Over breakfast, he snorts cocaine and takes another hit in the back of the cab, jabbering away about Frank Sauze. That man's a fucking god, Renton. An absolute fucking god. I saw him coming out at Valvona and Crawler the other day with an expensive bottle of wine and I thought, this is what we fucking lacked at Easter Road for years. That sort of class, he rants, his eyes do lally and his jaw grinding. Nicky's so stoned and full of canned fever, she hardly seems to notice the state he's in. I see them off, telling them I'm on the 12.30 to Amsterdam. But actually, I'm going to Frankfurt to get a connecting flight to Zurich. Switzerland is a fucking boring place. I lost all respect for Boy when I heard they lived there. But the banks are excellent. They really do ask no questions. So, when I signed the form to transfer the funds from the Banana Zuri account into the one I've set up at the city bank, nobody bats an eyelid. Well, the rotund, suited, bespectacled bank guy queries, Do you still want to keep this account open? Yes, I tell him. It's because we need immediate access to the monies as we're going into film production. However, the funds will soon be replenished as we have investors online for our next feature. We have some expertise in film financing. It might be useful to you or your partner, Mr. Williamson, to speak to Gustav next time you're over, Mr. Renton. We can set up a film production account from this company account, enabling you to write checks instantly and pay off creditors. Hmm, that's interesting. It would certainly save us a lot of bother if we could do it all under one roof, so to speak, I say, looking at the clock, not wanting to arouse suspicions, but anxious not to be detained. We need to talk about this, but in the short term I do have a flight to catch. Of course, forgive me, he says and the transaction is hurried through. And it was as easy as that. All I can think about is sick boy in can as I get back to Edinburgh. Seventy two Surging Waves We head by British Airways business class to the Côte d'Azur on the direct flight from Glasgow. As we approach Nice Airport, there's a clear blue sky and I can see the surging waves of the med lap against the golden sand. The seatbelt signs for landing are on, but Simon's repaired for the fourth time to the toilet and left it, as they say, flushed with excitement and intrigue. This is it, Nicky, this is it. You want to see hustling, ducking and diving, wheeling and dealing? Not particularly, I say, gazing up from L, watching his nostrils flare. I can see bits of cocaine on the hairs. Those cunts won't know what's hit them. They've never met the real deal before. He sniffs, rubbing at his nose. Then he looks at me almost painfully and kisses me softly on the cheek. You are art, him, he says before his chameleon eyes swivel and he spots a girl with long curled locks who's wearing shades pasted onto her head and dressed in a Prada jacket. 
Look at that, he says loudly and points. All that effort spoiled by a bad Manchester perm. Bet she's in publicity. She should sack her hairdresser. No, she should shoot the cunt, he says as his jaw slides out challengingly and a couple of people tut and look away. I smile benignly, knowing that it's useless to tell him to keep his voice down. Now he's ranting at me, telling me his life story. Begby through a glass, split a lassie's heed open. I used to shoot cunts with an air rifle. Renton was cruel to animals as a kid. There was something about him. You'd have thought he'd have grown up into a serial killer. Murphy stole my Coventry City Sabutio team. I found it in his house and he just happened to have bought it after mines went missing. My parents weren't rich. That was a big purchase. My mother, a decent saintly woman, she goes, Where's that nice new team we bought you, son? What can I say? It's in the scruff's house, mother. Even as we fucking well speak, those players are sliding across the old battered linoleum in the house of a thieving scruff, being crushed underfoot by careless drunken jippos who stagger into bedrooms looking for children to abuse. How could I say that to my mother? That house of Murphy's, what a fucking midden. I'm delighted to get off the plane. We pick up our bags and Simon's headed straight to the taxi rank. Aren't we going to wait for the others coming in on easy jet? I inquire. Don't think so somehow, he says warily. Listen, Nicky, the, er... Uh, Carlton was full, so I had to get them into the Beverly. It's still central. Is it less expensive? You could say that. He grins. Our suite's about 400 quid a night, and their rooms are 28 quid a night each. I shake my head in mock disgust, hoping he fails to register my artifice. But I need a smart gaff for business, he protests. It presents the wrong image to be seen in a rat hole. Not that the Beverly is a rat hole, of course. I'll bet it is, I say. This is very divisive, Simon. We're meant to be a team. We're talking Lock End and Wester Hales here. It'll be a luxury to them. I'm thinking of them, Nicky. They'd feel like a fish out of water. Could you honestly see Curtis and the Carlton? Mel with her tattoos? No, I wouldn't embarrass them or myself, he says snootily, head in the air, shades on, as we wheel our luggage trolley to the taxi rank. You're such a snob, Simon, I inform him, chortling loudly. Nonsense! I come from Leith. How can I be a snob? If anything, I'm a socialist. I'm just playing the politics of the business world, that's all. He snaps, then repeats. Renton better not fuck me about, because it'll be a total waste of a room. Just as well I had the foresight to cancel his at the Carlton and get him into the Beverly as well. That cunt's up to no good. Mark's okay. He's going out with Diane and she's a sweetheart. Granted, he's as plausible as fuck when he wants, but you don't know him like I do. Mind, I grew up with Rents. I know him. He's scum. We all are. Such low self-esteem, Simon. I'd never have thought it. He shakes his head like a dog coming out of the sea. I mean that in a positive sense, he says. But I know his nature. If that Diane's your mate, I'd tell her to watch her purse. We take a taxi to the Carlton, travelling down the packed coast road. I was going to plump for the Hotel du Cap, Simon explains, but it's too far from the centre of things and would have meant loads of taxi rides. This is right on La Croisette, he informs me as he berates the languid Latin taxi driver in impressive French. Vite! Je suis très pressé! Est-ce qu'il y a un itinéraire de dégagement? Eventually we get there and climb out the taxi, Two porters are straight onto our bags. Checking in, monsieur, mademoiselle. Oui, merci, I respond, but Simon's still standing outside, looking out to sea, watching the busy crowds milling along La Croisette, and then turning back to the great white gleaming structure of the Awardian Hotel. Simon, you okay? He takes off his ray-bands and sticks them into the top pocket of his yellow linen jacket. Just let me have this moment. He sniffs, squeezing my hand, and I see that there are tears welling up in his eyes. We step into the hotel foyer, which exudes a breathtaking opulence, dominated by black and gold pillars. Three shades of marble are evident, grey, orange and white, 
all of them finished with bountiful gold-leaf mouldings. Those chandeliers of crystal hanging imperiously on huge brass chains, the marble floor, the white walls and arched gateways, they just scream wealth and class. Up in the room, a thick pile of carpet makes you feel as if you're walking through treacle. The bed is colossal, and we have a fifty-channel television. The huge bathroom is packed with all sorts of toiletries, and there's a complimentary bottle of Rosé de Provence in an ice bucket, which Simon opens, pouring us a glass each and taking them to the balcony with the sea view. I'm looking out, and you can see that people are well impressed by this hotel. They walk along the seafront, gaping up at us. Simon, his shades back on, gives some people-watching tourists a tired wave, and they start nudging each other and snapping us with their cameras. I just wonder who they think we are. We relax on the balcony at the centre of the world, full of contentment, drinking the rosé, the heat combining with the liberation I've had on the plane, and last night's wine at Gavin's to make me feel very drowsy. But we're here. I'm here. I'm an actress, a fucking star, here, in Cannes. I wonder who else will be staying here now. Tom Cruise? Leonardo DiCaprio? Brad Pitt? In the very next room to us, maybe. Simon shrugs and snaps open his mobile phone. Whoever. They'll all have to fit in with our plans. He says idly as he punches in a number. Mel, you're in. Excellent. Curtis behaving himself. Good. Amuse yourselves and we'll call for you at seven. After the screening there's a party on and I'll blag some invites. Don't get too pissed. I write. Well, go to the beach or watch some telly. I'll see you in your lobby at seven. Right. He says, clicking the phone shut. Such an ingrate, he moans, then impersonates Mel. Me and Curtis have ni got money, Simon. How can we short we name money? I'm starting to feel very tired. I'm going to get my head down for an hour, Simon. I tell him, heading through to the room. Aye, he says, following me through. Simon puts on a porn film from a list that comes up on the screen under adult channels. He selects one called Rear Entry, In Through the Outdoor. That's wild. I never realised that that Led Zeppelin album was a reference to anal sex before. Confirms my feeling that Paige was a bit of a visionary, you know, the Crowley stuff and all that shite. Why are we watching this? I murmur drowsily. One, get us horny. Two, check out the opposition. Look at that. A woman is lying on her back, getting fucked. As we pull away, we see that the guy has her legs pinned over his shoulders. The implication is that he's forcing her back to access her arsehole, and he's fucking her up it. But it's impossible to tell at that angle whether it's going in her bum or her cunt. The thing I notice is that the woman has deep bruises on her wrists, some of them yellowing. This isn't so much disturbing as tacky, and makes me lose what vague interest I have in the film and I start to doze. The truth is, I don't really care to watch other people fucking. It bores me. This mattress is comfortable, as is the hotel gown, and I drift off. I wake up slightly chilled. My dressing gown has been opened, the cord undone, and I find Sick Boy crouching over me on the bed, masturbating furiously. I urgently pull the gown to me. Fuck, you've spoiled it now! He gasps bitterly. What? You're wanking over me! I. I sit up in bed, alarmed. Why don't I just put on blue lipstick and play dead for you? Oh no, he says. It's not a necrophilia thing, it's more innocent. I meant it as a tribute. You never heard of Sleeping Beauty, for fuck's sakes. You won't make love to me, but you'll sit and wank and watch crappy porn. What kind of a fucking tribute is that, Simon? You don't understand. He mumbles and snorts, his nose streaming, then snaps... I need some... some fucking perspective. What you need is to do less fucking coke, I shout, but half-heartedly because I really need to get some sleep. And as I try to drift off, I hear his voice droning on. Hey, you smoke too much dope and talk shit, he says, 
but I love you for it. Don't ever change. Pot's a great drug for chicks. Pot and E. I'm so glad that you don't do coke. It's a boy's drug. Girls can't take it. I know what you're going to say that's sexist, but no, it's an observation underpinned by an acknowledgement of the differences between men and women, which is an acknowledgement of women's autonomy, which is a feminist stance. So applaud, baby. Applaud. He says as he leaves the room. As I hear the door crash, I think to myself, thank fuck for that. Seventy-three. Scam number eighteen thousand seven hundred and fifty-two. I'm weaving through the narrow back streets, returning to La Croisette, scrutinising everything, burning indelible prints of the layout of the town into my brain. I'm appraising the mantle like a highly experienced farmer Ingleston's Royal Highland Show does with cattle. Here, the clucking of the chicks in the sexual marketplace, a searching glance enough to form a comprehensive assessment and valuation. PRs spitting tersely through paralysed grins into mobile phones, haughty shoppers and hopeful backpackers. They're all subject to a casual, voracious gaze. This producing game is a piece of piss. Why stop at porn? Why not make a proper movie? Get some lottery cash and off you go. Everybody's at it. Every top gangster realises that the best criminals are ex-criminals. Capitalise and go legit as soon as it's viable. You don't need the hassle. Jails for the likes of Begbie, who, for all their posturing, are losers and victims. Getting a bit of time in, in your youth, well, six months, fair enough. A wee bit of learning experience. But if you didn't learn after being six months banged up that it wasn't for you, then you were truly fucked. Nobody likes jail. But some sorry cunts just didn't dislike it enough. Can is where I want to be. It represents options. But it isn't just that it's not Leith or Hackney. It isn't the physical place. It's me. I'm not just a desperate hustler now with nothing to trade. I'm realising that no matter how cool I'd played it in the past, I could never escape giving off that slight predictability, that edge of desperation. And I couldn't because when it came down to it, it was all a front and I had nothing to trade in the marketplace. At long last, through getting a sweaty pile of bodies together and filming the results, I have something to sell, something they value, something I've made. Simon Williamson has a product which isn't sick boy. This is business. It's nothing personal. I'm touting a Simon David Williamson film. I go back to the hotel, intending to sunbathe and try to relax for a bit, maybe chat up some chicks. We don't have loads of time and this comedian in the hotel's pissed me off. 400 bar a night. And you still need to pay 15 quid a day to use a private beach at the front. Just like the fucking non-resident plebs who should in any case be kept off. In the room, Nicky's up, but since we're pushed for time, we settle for a bit of scran in the hotel. She's okay after catching me jerking off over her. I've just about managed to convince her that it was a tribute. Chicks. What else could it be? Anyway, satisfyingly full. We make our way to the Scabble Hotel to pick up Mel and Kurt for the screening of Seven Rides for Seven Brothers. The cinema it's showing in is a small but smart pad on one of the back streets. It's rumoured that Lars Lavish, Ben Dover, Lindsay Drew and Nina Hartley, Nicky's heroine, will attend the screening. But I can't see anybody I recognise. There's a good turnout, mind you, and there's a few bodies that sneak in after the lights go down. I'm trying to scan the audience to gauge the reaction of this half-full cinema. I'm so hyped up, I don't need any, Charlie, but I take a hit off my card anyway. So do Mel and Curtis. I can't resist going, Fwoah! When Melanie appears naked on screen for the first time, she gives me a playful dig in the ribs. It's Nicky who makes the impact, though. From the moment she peels off that tight lycra top and exposes that shaved pussy and struts arrogantly across the screen, you can feel the electricity in the air. There are one or two big cheers from the crowd and I turn to catch her looking bashful and I squeeze her hand. The real smash hit, though, is Curtis, or I should say Curtis's cock. The first sight of that pole produces a few wows and I turn to see our boy's huge teeth glisten in the dark. Outside after the show, we're all getting our flesh pressed and cards are being produced as we're urged to go to various parties. I know the one I want, though, and it's not a porno gig. It's the industry doing the big marquee on the Quasette. All the porn players want to be at that one. But I managed to blag four invites. 
and we're in. After a few drinks, Nikki's pissed, and she starts to get on my tits. Why are you talking in that ridiculous voice, Simon? She cuts in when I'm chanting this fucking doll with long, straight blonde hair, who apparently is something big at Fox Searchlight. He accuses me of being Mockney, then as soon as he gets off the plane he's full of that shit. The foxy girl raises an eyebrow, and I set my face in a wheel-clamped smile. What accent, Nicola? This is the way I talk, I say slowly. Nicky nudges Mel and says, This is the way I talk, Nicola. The name's Williamson. Simon David Williamson. Oh, sick boy! Mel guffaws, and those fucking twisted, inappropriate, jealous vixens cackle like the fucking witches in Macbeth as some creepy cunt comes over and grabs Fox Searchlight's arm, leading her away. I'm seething at their stupid pettiness. There may be something to be gained from trying to undermine me in my efforts to network and sell this fucking film we spent the best part of the last six fucking months of our lives making. I heave the words out in terse rage through clenched teeth. But I'm absolutely fucked if I can see what it is. They look at each other, silent for a split second. Then Melanie goes, No, and they're off in hysterics again. Fuck this. I'm retreating into the crowd and my searchlight's trained, looking for that fox I've been hunting. I hit the bock, and I'm about to do some Charlie when I see some guys going into a cubicle and I bundle in with them, getting a couple of lines off them. I re-emerge supercharged, and I look over and see Nicky and Mel flirting outrageously with some creepy-looking arseholes. Kurt seems to have vanished. I head across to the girls. One guy who's been schmoozing with Nicky sees me approach and asks oddly, And you are? I lean close into him. I am the cunt who's gonna break your fucking nose for chanting my bud, I say, pin my arm around Nicky. The wanker blusters a bit on the spot, then timidly exits. Unfortunately, so do Nicky and Mel, making the pretense of getting more drinks, but both singularly unimpressed with my performance. I go back to the bog, where one guy who shared his ching with me approaches hopefully. Sorry, mate. Private party, I tell him. That's not exactly fair... He complains. Post-democracy, mate. Now fuck off! I boom as I slam the door in his face and powder my nose. Soon I'm back outside, swanning around in my element, when I'm interrupted by the sing-song accent in my ear. Shyman? How are you, my friend? It's that revolting cunt Miz. I'm about to be off-hand or even rude now that he's expended his usefulness when he says, I want you to meet somebody and he nods to a tall guy with a moustache behind him who looks familiar. Lish is Lars Lavish. Lars Lavish is one of Europe's premier porn actors turned producers. His ability to find wood was legend, and he was known as the godfather of gonzo porn, accosting lassies in the streets of Paris, Copenhagen and Amsterdam, and enticing them back to a studio to make an impromptu porno flick with him. The man's gift of the gab is renowned. All he used was charm, persuasion, and cash and cock inducements. He recently signed a big deal with a major distributor, and now does all his own stuff and has complete editorial control. In other words, I'm absolutely fucking starstruck. This is my hero, my mentor. I can hardly fucking well think, never mind speak. Lars Lavish. Lars! I shake his hand, and I don't even mind that he's now got his arm round Nicky. Pleased to meet you, Simon, he grins, glancing down at Nicky. This girl is so hot. She's the hottest man, the hottest. Seven rides, man. It is so good. I am thinking that we are going to have to be having a serious talk about the distribution of this movie. I am thinking even limited theatrical release. I have died and gone to heaven. Any time, Lars. Any time, mate. This is my card. Please, call me, he says, then kisses Nicky and heads off into the crowd with Miz, who looks back at me with a satisfied shake of his head. Nicky and I are soon in a strange discussion, which turns a bit narky. Why is it all those men's mags, Loaded, FHM, Maxim, are just like porn mags, like Mayfair, Penthouse and Playboy, scanty cover outside, nudes inside? because men's magazines are for men who are wankers, which means all men, but who like to pretend that they're not. 
How can you have an imaginative space and a sexuality and not be a wanker? The shit that somebody like Renton would come out with is that he gets aroused thinking about certain things, so he goes and has a nice, mature discussion with his nice, mature girlfriend, and they negotiate sensibly and play out those fancies in a loving, supportive, mutually rewarding and fulfilling way. But what a load of fucking pish! No, we need tits and arse because they have got to be available to us, to be pawed, fucked, wanked over. Because we're men? No. Because we are consumers. Because those are the things we like. Things we intrinsically feel or have been conned into believing will give us value, release, satisfaction. We value them so we need to at least have the illusion of their availability. For tits and arse, read coke, crisps, speedboats, cars, houses, computers, designer labels, replica shirts... That's why advertising and pornography are similar. They sell the illusion of availability and the non-consequence of consumption. Your conversation is boring me, Nikki says, and she walks away. Fucker. I'm cruising on a massive fucking high and everybody else, everything else, will just have to fit in with my fucking plans. Seventy-four. Killer cystitis. Lars Lavish is trying to get into my knickers. These porn guys are pretty thick, if brutally single-minded. It's dull but more interesting than Simon's company. He's being a tedious, coked-up pain in the arse. I don't want to be too hard on him because it is his moment and he should enjoy it, with pride coming before a fall and all that stuff. But he's just impossible. He wants to fuck everything in sight, like Curtis, who actually is fucking everything in sight. The posh girls are queuing up, morbid and squeamish and girly girl, for a shot of that prick, news of which is flying round the marquee grapevine, and his swagger tells you that the young lad is growing into that penis at last, from burger bar to porn star. He vanished for a bit with a companion and now they've reappeared. How are you doing, Kurt? Great, he says, pulling this girl along by the hand. Her eyes are bulging out and she can hardly walk straight. This is the best time I've had in my life. I'm finding it hard to argue. I pull him to me and whisper in his ear. Remember what you were saying about those guys? You were at school with? How they teased you at being a freak? Well, who was wrong and who was right? They were wrong, I was right, he says. It's a shame that the likes of Danny and Philip and that couldn't he be here to see all this. They'd love it. Simon has heard this and cuts in. It's like the underground in London, mate. They rely on enough people to be sheep. They dinny supply bins, you see. They expect you to carry your rubbish around with you. I don't do that. I just drop it anywhere. But enough people do it to make it pay for them no to provide bins. I, I didn't get you. What I'm saying, pal, is that you drop your rubbish, you never carry it around with you, and here it's just excellent without the rubbish, he says snootily. Sick boy. God, he is that. He's making a fuss of this girl called Ronnie, who he says is from Fox Searchlight. Ronnie's invited us all to the Fox Searchlight due tomorrow. He beams. I pull him aside. Just take her back and fuck her now, Simon. She looks well up for it. Or is it a purely nasal romance? Don't be petty, Nicky, he sneers. It's just a vehicle to get the tickets for this bash. He's full of bullshit. The party ends and we head to a club for a bit, but it's so busy that we can barely move, so we decide to go back to our suite at the hotel. This is Barry, Curtis says, impressed by the opulence of the place. Our little party is confronted by a commissionaire who asks rather imperiously, Are you guests at the hotel? No. By no stretch of the imagination could you say that, Simon replies starchily. As the uniformed official is about to turf us out, he then produces his room key. Being a guest involves receiving some kind of hospitality, some kind of rudimentary courtesy. We do stay at the hotel... However, but no, you couldn't call us guests. 
The commissionaire goes to say something, but dismissing him with the waving motion of somebody brushing aside a noxious odour, Simon strides on ahead. I follow with a somewhat apologetic grin, as do the others. We get up to the room and drink the bar dry, Simon irritating me with his overbearing smarm directed at Miss Fox Suchlight. The way they shovel up the cocaine together is quite frightening. A pornographic film? And Curtis hears the star? She asks, looking all bug-eyed at him. Curtis is lying on the couch as Mel shakes her head. Aye, well, Curtis and Mel and Nicky too, of course. Sick boy deigns to elucidate. The girls always rule up porn. But Curtis has a certain asset which elevates him way beyond the standard ten-inch a penny actors. Of course, I have a part myself. Really? Miss Searchlight says, rubbing his arm as they devour each other with their eyes. Their molten flirtation makes me feel as if I've eaten too much candy floss. I listen to him slavering away for a bit and then I drift off to sleep on the bed. When I wake up in the night, my bladder heavy, I stagger to the toilet for a long, jagged, broken glass pee, which heralds the start of killer cystitis. The minibar is empty. Simon and Fox Searchlight have gone, and Curtis and Mel are crashed out on the chaise long in a fully clothed embrace. I'm sitting on the toilet seat trying to press this toxic piss out of my bladder. I phone room service and ask them to send up some Nurofen. Fortunately, I have some Silenol in my bag and I take a powder. It's agonising, though. I can't sleep, and I'm in a fevered sweat. Simon comes in and sees my discomfort. "'What's up, baby?' "'I tell him as the room service guy enters. "'Simon brings the Nurofen over. "'Now kick in soon, babes, don't worry. "'Have you taken your silent all?' "'I nod weakly. "'I didn't fuck that Ronnie, you know,' he explains hastily. "'We just went for a stroll along the beach "'because everybody else was crashed out. "'I'm a one-woman man these days, baby. "'Well, off-screen, any roads.' A stroll along the beach. It sounds so romantic that now I'm wishing he'd just fucked her quickly in her hotel room. He sees Mel and Kurt and goes over and shakes them awake. It's nearly morning. Can you head back to the Beverly and give us a wee bit time alone, folks, please? Mel's face screws up, but she rises. Right. Come on, Curtis. Curtis gets up and sees my tears. What, what's wrong with Nicky? "'Women's problems. She'll be fine. See you in a bit,' Simon says. Curtis doesn't accept this, though, and he comes over to the bed. "'Are you all right, Nicky?' I acknowledge his concern, and as he kisses me sweetly on my fevered brow, I throw my arms around his skinny waist. Then Mel comes over and I give her a hug and a kiss. "'I'm okay. I think the powders are starting to work. "'It's just this cystitis. Too much wine and spirits.' I think that corrosive champagne's bad for it as well. When they depart, Simon and I get into bed, lying with our back to each other, stiff and tense, me with my pain, him with his cocaine. Eventually I start to ease up and unravel in the bed. It must be mid-afternoon when I wake up, disturbed by his moving around. He comes and sits on the bed with a room service tray, croissant, coffee, orange juice, rolls and fresh fruit. "'Feeling better?' he asks, kissing me. "'Yeah, loads.' "'And I'm looking into his eyes, the both of us, in silence. "'After a bit he squeezes my hand and says, "Nicky, I behaved abominably last night. "'It wasn't just the drink or the ching, it was the occasion. "'I wanted this to go so right and I was a control freak, a fascist. "'What's new?' I remark. I want to make it up tonight, before we all go to the Fox Searchlight Party, he says, his face split with a huge grin. Then he adds, I've got some brilliant news. He's glowing. I have to ask, what's that? We've only been shortlisted for Best Film at the Adult Film Festival Awards. I got the call this morning. Wow, that is so, like, wonderful. I hear myself say. Too fucking right it is. 
Simon gleefully observes. And yourself, myself and Curtis have been nominated in the best newcomer categories for actress, director and actor. I feel such a massive surge of elation, I'm almost sticking to the ceiling. To celebrate our nomination, Simon's taking me to dinner at what he refers to as one of the finest restaurants, not just in Cannes, but in France, which of course means the world. I'm wearing a sparkling pea-green Prada dress with some high-heeled Gucci shoes. I have my hair up and I'm adorned with a small pair of gold earrings, a necklace and some bangles. Simon, who's wearing a yellow cotton suit and a white shirt, is looking at me and shaking his head. You are the very essence of femininity, he says, seeming almost awestruck in admiration. I'm tempted to ask him if he said the same thing to Fox Searchlight last night, but I let it go, because I don't want to spoil the moment. We are here, and it is now, and I know that won't always be the case. And it is wonderful, the sort of small Provence restaurant where cooking is raised to high art, from the amuse-bouche through a sublime omard bleu, succli de truffes noir et basilic pile, and chicken breast demi dull covered in an inky truffle sauce, to the pièce de résistance, a pile of truffles that enveloped a crisp green salad. Lovely. For dessert, I went for the coffee chocolate coup glacé with a daring cup of liquid chocolate and a brioche to dip in it. All this was washed down with a bottle of champagne, crystal Louis Rodere, a clos de bois chardonnay and two large Remy Martin cognacs. We're intoxicated by everything, lisping seductively at each other in pidgin French, when Simon's mobile rings, the green one, it annoys me that he can never seem to switch them off. Hello? Who is it? I hiss, more than mildly irritated that our moment has been invaded. Simon puts his hand over the receiver. He looks quite concerned for a bit, then breaks into a waspish smile. It's Francois. Some wildly important news about a card school in Letha forgot about. How remiss of me to double book my diary. He speaks calmly into the phone. I'm in France, Frank, at the Cannes Film Festival. There's a sharp voice buzzing on the other end. Simon holds the phone away from him. Then he winks raffishly at me and says into the receiver, cupping the other hand over his ear, Frank, are you still there? Hello? He puts his hand over the mouthpiece and giggles. Francois is being rather difficult. Trust me to forget that the Cannes Film Festival and the Leith Card School clashed. I should get a helicopter to Leith straight away. He sniggers, his shoulders shaking, and now I'm laughing too. Are you still there, Frank? Hello? He shouts into the phone. Then he scrapes the grill of the mouthpiece with his fingernail. I can't hear you, you're breaking up. I'll phone you back later, he says, then snaps the phone shut and switches it off. He's such a prick you can't even hate him. It's beyond that, he says in stunned admiration. The man is beyond love or hate. He simply is. Then he grabs my hand across the table. How can somebody like him and somebody like you exist in the same world? How can planet Earth produce such a range of humanity? And we were straight back into each other again. Simon arrogantly tossed the odd withering glance around the room, but mostly our complicit eyes ate each other dancing and teasing in and out of each other's souls. To have enjoyed such intimacy, to fuck would actually be an anticlimax. Almost. Do we have time to go back to the room before we meet the others? I ask him. I'll make time, he says, waving the mobile. I repair to the toilet and push my fingers down my throat, throwing up the food and gargling with mouthwash from my bag. It's lovely food, but far too rich and fattening to actually digest. Like most modern, intelligent women, I'm a Jungian, but Freud did have one thing going for him in that he hated fat people, probably because they were happy and well-adjusted and therefore didn't lie in his pockets like the skinny neurotics. But now, at this moment, I'm happy. 
I've had my cake and eaten it, then sicked it up before it could damage me. When I go back to the restaurant, there's a row going on, and to my mounting unease I can tell that it's over at our table. This card cannot be over the limit. That simply cannot be the fucking case. Simon shouts, his face florid with the drink and probably cocaine. But please, monsieur... I don't think you're hearing me. That simply cannot be the fucking case. But monsieur, please... Simon's voice breaks into a low hiss. Don't fucking geese it, you froggy cunt. You want Cruz in here? You want DiCaprio to eat in here? I'm supposed to be meeting Billy Bob Thornton here tomorrow to discuss a major fucking project. Simon, I shout, what's going on? Sorry. Okay, okay, there's been some mistake. Just try this one. He hands over another card which instantly goes through. Despite the maitre d's sour expression, Simon looks smug and vindicated, and not only does he refuse to leave a tip, he shouts back into the dining room in parting, Je ne reviendrai pas! Outside, I'm teetering between finding this whole thing annoying and amusing. As I'm still on such a massive high, I opt for the latter, bursting into a drunken, nervous fit of giggles. Simon looks sourly at me then shakes his head and starts laughing himself. That was nonsense. It's the Banana Zuri company card I tried to pay with. There's loads of cash in there. All the 1690 scam money is in there, and only Rents and I are the signatories, and he's in the... D he stops dead for a second, and a cold panic fuses in his eyes. If that cunt... Don't be so paranoid, Simon, I laugh. Mark will be here tomorrow as planned. Let's go back, I whisper in his ear, and make love. Make love? Make fucking love? When a ginger cunt could be taking everything a fucking well worked for? Don't be stupid, I implore him. Simon, as if trying to control and fortify himself, stretches his arms out in front of him. Okay, okay, I'm probably being silly. Tell you what, you go back and give me fifteen minutes to compose myself and make a few phone calls. I respond with a sulky frown, but he's not moving. I head away, reluctantly going back to the hotel room, where I pour myself a drink, thinking about the bastard on the beach with that fox searchlight bitch. When he returns, he's calmed down and is in better spirits. You got Mark, I take it? No, but I spoke to Diane. She said he just called her from Amsterdam. He's calling her again later, so I told her to tell him to phone me straight away. He explains, then pleads. Sorry, babes. I was jumpy. But too much ching. I move over to him and grab his balls firmly through the material of his trousers, feeling his cock stiffen. A big smile grows over his face. You fucking dirty cow. He laughs and he's on me and in me, and we make frenzied love hotter even than our first few times. Later, we rendezvous along with Mel and Kurt and head out to the Fox Searchlight Party. It's pretty dull at first, but an excellent DJ livens things up and we get thrashed again. When it finishes, we get into a launch and head out to a do on the private boat, an old cruise ship moored in the Med, which has been converted into a film studio. It's a porn star's party, with banging cheesy Euro techno and free drinks. Simon's obviously a bag of nerves, on the mobile all the time trying to get Mark. He attempts to make light of things. If this music doesn't make you want butt-fucked, Nicky, nothing will. You're right, I tell him. Nothing will. Myself, Mel and Curtis are going for it on the dance deck, although Kurt keeps disappearing and coming back with a grin on his face and a deranged starlet in tow. Mel and I are constantly getting hit on by all manner of guys, including Lars Lavish and Miz, but we're enjoying our sense of power, knocking everybody back but flirting outrageously and prick-teasing horribly. At one stage we go into a toilet cubicle and make love, bringing each other off, only the second time we've been intimate in that way without a camera. When we get back on deck, wired but satisfied, smirking at each other, we see Simon still constantly trying to get signals on the mobiles. More launches arrive and the boat is filling up. 
I see a thin girl with long blonde hair from the side of my vision, which isn't surprising. But the voice I can hear talking to her makes me do a quick double take. Simon even clicks off his phone in shock. Aye, but people think that I get called Juice Terry because of the load of juice that I shoot off in they cum shots. But no, it goes back to the time that I used to deliver the juice, or what you Americans might call soda. But the technical term is aerated waters, eh? Listen, doll, no fancy going downstairs for a bit. Explore the ship and that. Maybe a bit mere than the ship. Lawson, Simon shouts. Sicky! Terry roars, then he sees Mel and me. Nicky, we're hit, Mel! All right, gorgeous! He turns to his companion. This is Carla. She's in the business San Fernando Valley stuff likes. What was your film again, doll? A butt fucker in Pussy City? This blonde girl with an American accent smiles cheesily. Aye, Biddle's here and all. Biddle Senior, that is. Tell as he was going over to see his bird and niece, so I just sort of invited myself along. Got the train down here and blagged into the porn film festival tent. Tell every cunt I was juice Terry for seven rides and got sorted out with a pass. He points to an orange badge with private adult films, Juice Terry Lawson, performer, emblazoned on it. Can he wait to get back to Edinburgh, hit the slut land at the West End with this own? Delighted you could make it tell, Simon says curtly. Excuse me for a second. And he heads towards the starboard, punching digits into his green mobile. Terry grabs a handful of my arse, repeating the exercise with Mel's, and with a sly wink he vanishes with Carla, who evidently thinks, thanks to Simon's editing of Seven Rides, that Terry's cock is Curtis's. She'll be disappointed, Mel laughs, but not that disappointed. This Eurotechno is so bouncy I'm almost wishing I had an E, but I'm not really a chemical sort. After a bit, an agitated Simon approaches us with another bulletin. There's no Renton, so he must be on his way here, but that specky wee Lauren says that that Diane's gone. Or at least that's what I think she said. The stroppy wee who will need talk to me, Nicky. You phone her, he says, now thrusting his white mobile at me. Please, he urges. I call Lauren and speak with her for a minute or two, asking about her health. Then I ask about Diane. After, I turn to Simon. Diane's only staying at her mum's for a few days, that's all. She's not been too well. What's her mother's phone number? I need to speak to Diane. Simon, will you just, like, chill out? You'll see Mark, like, tomorrow, at the hotel? He wouldn't miss this for the world, I urge him, swinging back into the beat with Mel. But Simon's shaking his head, not listening to a word I'm saying. No. No! He moans, then smashes his fist into his palm. That cunt, Renton! Right, you cunt, that's it! He pulls out his green mobile phone. Who are you calling now? Begby. Melanie looks at me in amazement. Why does he use his green one to call Begby and his white one to call Lauren? He did explain this to me once, but some things are too sad to even talk about. Now Simon's listening to some sort of tirade on the phone with mounting impatience as the red sunset falls behind his back. Eventually he snaps at the mouthpiece. Never mind that fucking crap. Renton's back. In Edinburgh. Then there's a brief pause and Simon looks incredulous. He's saying, What? Across the road? What the fuck? Keep him there, Franco. Then he let him go. He's got my fucking cash. He stares at the dead phone in his hand, then shakes it violently. Fucking pea-brained cunt! Miz comes over with Lars Lavish. He touches Simon on the arm gently. You know, Simon, we are for thinking. To my horror, Simon turns and headbutts him in the face at force, and he's on top of Miz, flaying at him and screaming, You Dutch cunts have got my fucking money, you dirty homosexual orange cunts! takes all of us plus half a dozen Swedish bouncers to pull him off and restrain him. Terry arrives back on deck and he's laughing as they push Simon into a launch. You are lucky we do not want the police on this boat. A bouncer shouts at Simon as Curtis, Mel, two girls, Terry, Carla and myself join him. 
As he gingerly steps onto the launch, Terry sneakily whacks the talkative Swede on the side of the face. Morn then, cunt, he invites. The guy stands rooted petulantly rubbing his jaw, looking like he's going to burst into tears as the launch pulls away from the liner. We can hear an agitated miss screaming, He is crazy! He is a crazy man! as we head for the shore. Terry turns to Curtis. That cock of yours has come in useful to me, mate, he says, putting an arm round Carla. Then he contemplates Curtis, a girl on each side of him. Mind you, it's no doing you much harm either. I'm regarding Simon, who is sitting with his eyes tightly closed, shaking, both his arms wrapped around himself, repeating in a loud, gasping whisper, Toleranza zero, toleranza zero, over and over again. Simon, what is it? I only hope that Francis Begbie kills Mark Renton. I pray that happens, he says as he crosses himself. Seventy-five. Cared school. After then drinking. It does you in, but you can't fucking beat it. Sometimes, but I think that I see them. Just coming into the bar. That cunt Donnelly gadge or that chizzy beast. That's the problem. There's fuck all today and too much time to think, especially in the hoose. That's how I keep going out, down to the boozer. I knew. It's not as if you get much fucking conversation down here. Nelly goes all silent and starts playing with his paint. What the fuck's up with you? I goes. That Larry phoned up last night. When I was out with you, he nudged to Malky. She was in in a rain with the bairns. He goes, I'm coming for yous. Oh, yous. Then he tells her, If you've got any sense, you'll get yourself back down to Manchester or wherever it is ye comfy. Your bird's Welsh, is you know? Malky goes. Aye, Swansea, Nelly says, or stroppy. But he doesn't ken that. I met her in Manchester. But you ken what that sick cunt says later? The message that he left in the machine? Me and Malky are shaking our fucking heads. I'll fucking well show yees, Nelly says. I'll fucking well show you the kind of cunt we've been drinking with, he goes, looking all that fucking hot way to me. Like it was me that made the cunt drink with Larry. I'm saying fucking now, but... Because I want a fucking laugh out of this. So he goes up to Nelly's and he's got the messages on the machine. He plays you in back and it's Larry's voice, all right. A sort of soft, creepy whisper. Leave tune. Leave toon, cause I'm coming for ye, and I'm coming fae muir hoos, tae your hoos. I am coming to kiss yous all good night. That cunt's been watching too many fucking films, Malky laughs. Nelly looks back all hard at him. It's got her shitin' herself. She's talking about taking the bairns to her ma's down in Wales. Saying that's what we left Manchester for in the first place. I'm looking at him, but I'm saying no. Malky's saying fuck all and all. I need to sort this out, he goes. If he keeps that shite up, he's going down a fucking hole, I'm telling you that. Where's he fucking kidding? He's never wasted any cunt in his life. All that fucking bullshit about what he's meant to have done down in Manchester with that Cheatham Hill mob. If he was that well quoted down there, what's he fucking well doing back up here? Look, Malky goes, this is getting out of hand. Franco, you gonna talk to Larry? Sort all this out? So now it's fucking Malky telling every cunt what they should and shouldn't be doing, is that it? We'll fucking we'll see about that. But then I thinks, no, play it his way. And I looks over at Nelly. If you want. Then Malky turns round and says to him, But you'll have to tell the cunt that you were out of order and apologised for what you did in the pub. Nelly's saying out for a bit. 
And we're both staring at the cunt. Then he goes, If he fucking apologises for making they fucking sick phone calls to my house, I'll apologise to him for battering them. Right, I goes. Enough of all this shite. Supposed to be fucking mates. This needs sorted out. The night at the care school at Sick Boys. Will Larry show up? Malky's wondering. If I tell him he'll fucking show up, I'm going. So that's me doing my good deed for the day and being the fucking peacemaker as usual. They fucking bams would kill each other if it wasn't for the likes of me sorting everything out. All that shite bit. It's good as a fucking migraine, so in the way hame I stops off at the foot of the walk and gets some Nurofen plus for the paper. I phoned sick boy and his moby to remind him about the cared school the night. I'm in France, Frank, at the Cannes Film Festival, the smarmy cunt says. A tipples that the cunt isn't he fucking joking or not. What about our fucking cared school? I tell you we were having a fucking cared school down at yours. Frank? Uh, are you still there? Hello? What about our fucking cared school? I got to tell Renton's been seen. I'm wanting a fucking word with you, you cunt. Are you still there, Frank? Hello? What's that cunt fucking well playing it? Our fucking cared school. I'm going to fucking kill you, you cunt. There's a fucking crackling of static on the line. Then the cunt goes... I can't hear you and you're breaking up. I'll phone you back later and it just goes fucking dead. Fucking Raj! That cunt thinks he can treat us like shite. Swan off to fucking France with all his pals for that dirty club. That fucking juice Terry and all the other fucking witty old fucking nonce stow at the ball fucking perverts and hangouts. I'll fucking well show that sneaky fucking lying cunt. So after my tea, I bells Nelly and Malky and Larry and tells them that that cunt's let us down and to meet up at the central bar. We gets there and it's just Nelly and Malky. Larry's not even fucking well showed up, but eh? He bells us on the moby to say that he's going to be a wee bit late, but he'll definitely fucking be there. I think it's just to put a bit of pressure on Nelly. You can see that the cunt's looking all tense. Anyway... We've got the cards out in one of the booths and the pints of Guinness are going down thick and fast. I never used the central much, but for some reason I was like a pint of Guinness when I'm in there. After a bit, I still need sign a larry. I hears the tone going in my moby, but it's that cunt sick boy. I'll give him breaking up. I'll fucking well break that cunt up. I goes outside the pub to get a better signal. Aye, it's fucking sick boy all right. Just as well for that cunt that he phoned us back. Where the fuck are you? I goes. I've got things to fucking well talk to you about. Our fucking cared school. Never mind that fucking crap he goes. And I'm just about to fucking well lose it when he says, Renton's back in Edinburgh. So it's fucking true. I'm trying to think what to say and I looks up across the street. And there he fucking is. That red-headed thieving cunt is at the cash point over the fucking road for us. He's... I'm fucking well screaming into the phone. He's across the fucking road for us. I hear sick boy saying stuff like, keep a hood of him and I'm wanting to see him when I get back. But then that cunt Renton looks right out at us and I just clicks off the fucking phone. Seventy-six. Whores of Amsterdam, part eleven. Spud's fucking cat. I remember just as I'm coming in Edinburgh. When I call him, he tells me that he's given all his cash to Ali and predictably asks me if I can lend him some money, 300 quid. What can I say but yes? He's in his house, feared to go out. So I take a cab from the airport to Diane's to pick up the cat. It takes me ages to get the fucking thing into the carrier. They make me allergic and I'm sneezing like fuck. I lose my cool and grab the bastard and take a scratch across my arm in retaliation. Don't hurt him, Mark! Diane snaps as I stuff the spitting bag of shit into the carrier and secure the door. She's packed and I take her down to Gavin's. We arrange to meet at the airport at 8 o'clock for the 9pm flight, the last one to London, and our connecting flight to San Francisco. I know how Spud feels about being scared to go out, but here I am, in the taxi, heading down to Leith, with a dos cunt's fucking cat. 
My napper's buzzing, and I'm thinking that this is where I came in, ripping off sick boy. I get out at Pilrig to the cash point. The Clydesdale's fucked, and there's a grey-haired guy with a Glasgow accent booting it in frustration. There are nae cunting taxis to be seen. So, with some trepidation, I pull my hat down and walk, the cat carrier swinging uncomfortably against my legs down towards the Halifax at the foot of the walk. The cat mews treacherously, as if trying to attract the attention I'm seeking to avoid. They do link at this cash point. Funny how you mind these things after all the years. I used to feel so at home, so safe the further down the walk I got. Now it feels like a descent into Hades. I won't be here for long enough though. Because as soon as this fucking cat's delivered, I'm offski in a fast black to meet Diane. Then it's the big white tin bird again. My spirit's sore as I see a queue at the cash point at the foot of the walk. There's a drunk trying to operate it. I approach the cunt, cautiously, anxiety oozing out of me. I can hear some guys shouting threats at each other in Junction Street. You miss this atmosphere in Amsterdam. This atmosphere of barely repressed casual violence and aggression. This procession of paranoia. It just doesn't exist over there. Come on, mate, sort it out. Then I hear a familiar voice and it cuts me in two. And by a wrenching effort of will, I look across the road in its direction. Begbie. Shouting into a mobile phone. Then he sees me and stands open-mouthed outside the central bar. He's momentarily paralysed by shock we both are. Then he snaps the phone shut and roars, Renton! My blood is frozen in my veins, and all I can see is Frank Begbie tearing across the road towards me, face contorted with rage, and it's like he'll just run right past me. And do some cunt else, cause he doesn't know me now and I'm nothing to do with him anymore. But I know it's me he wants. And it's going to be a bad one. And I should run. But I can't. In those few seconds, life shredded into a million thoughts. I reflect how hopeless and ludicrous my martial arts pretensions are. All that training and practice will count for nothing. It's all shorn away by the expression on his face. I can't abstract anything, because an old childhood tape is playing relentlessly in my head. Big Bay equals evil equals fear. I am in total paralysis of will. The parts of me that envisage the simple adoption of the Wadu Ryu stance, blocking his blow, ramming his nose into his brain with the palm of my hand, or sidestepping his lunge and elbow in his temple. Yes, they are present, but they're feeble impulses, easily overwhelmed by the mortifying fear that I'm slow dancing with. Begbie's coming at me, and I can't do anything. I can't shout. I can't plead. There's nothing I can do. Seventy-seven. Home. Ali's sister Kath never really liked his man And she pure doesn't like Ali hanging out with us again Ali just wants to come home now with Andy Because I was worried about going out But she came round and we went to the pictures together I've got that wiring off the jaw So I'm pure back on the solids again Even though it's awfully stiff Ali and me have never necked like gone for years And the jaw is not the only thing that's stiff I'm thinking about seeing come back with us for a bit when I mind that I had arranged to meet rents down the house. So I tears myself away, still sair, but bouncing down the walk, high but aw wary in case I see Franco. There's been all sorts of reports, but it could be just talk. You never really can for sure. Rent says that he'd be doing by now, and I'm worried that I've missed the gadge. When I gets to the foot of the walk, there's a bit of a commotion, an ambulance and a police car and a big crowd around. The shivers are pilling on me like I was in junk withdrawal. Because when you see a police car or an ambulance in Leith, well, I suppose there's a few names that crop up, but there's just one on my mind right now. All I see is home. But I'm thinking, what if Begbie's got Mark? My hair's banging, man. Oh, fuck 
No. I saw him first, Begby. He's done. Begby's been done. He's on the deck, Franco. He's fucked. Cause he's on the ground standing over him where the ambulance boys and there's there's a ginger headed boy on top of him and it looks like Fucking hell is the rain boy. It looks like he's alright. This is rinsing Begby and it's No. No. It's like Rents has done Begby and done him bad. Then a chilly spasm goes through his again cause where's my cat but where's Zappa? No way. There's no way can I stop and get involved in this man. No fucking way but I've got to find a cat. I pull my collar up and my baseball cap down and I push through the mob. Then I see his Nelly coming out for the crowd and he bangs Rents a shot in the face. Rents staggers a bit and huds his jaw as Nelly shouts something and slopes back into the crowd. A policeman goes up to Renton, but Mark's shaking his head like he's no grassing Nelly up and he just gets in the ambulance with Begby. And then I see him. It's Sapa. My poor cat just left there. Left there in the street. So I goes over and picks the carrier up with my good arm. This lassie that had been bent down, petting him through the wire, gives us a dirty look. I ken who his cat this is, I tell her. I'll get it back to him. That's what he ordered. You can't leave a cat lying out in the street, the lassie goes. Hi, too right, I says. Just want to get out of there, because it's pure freaky man. are just jangling, Ken. Then Nelly sees us. And he's right over to me. He points the finger at us and hisses. Fucking junky cunt. Never really liked that cat. And I'm no fear to him. Even smashed up like I am. I'm about to say something back. When I sees this boy. A boy I've seen knocking about with Franco. And he comes up behind Nelly and hits him in the back. Not that hard. Then just sort of dances away. Merging into the onlookers. Nelly twists around to scratch his back like a itchy and sees all this blood on his hands. I see the fright in his eyes as the other boy wades through the crowd with a big smile on his coot. He gives me a wee wink. Then he vanishes. And so they are, man. I'm pure away him with Zappa. I'm thinking that it was bad of Mark to leave the cat in the road. That was as cruel as, man. But... Mind you, he was under pressure with Franco and that. No. But the thing is with me, I've got Zappa back. Then it'll be Ali and Andy, and everything's going to be better again. That's for defo. Seventy-eight. Whores of Amsterdam, part twelve. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't do anything. Couldn't shout, plead, or nothing. And the boys in the car didn't see him. There was nothing I could do. The car hit Franco at force just a few feet away from me. He was thrown right over the top of it and he crashed down onto the road. He lay there, immobile, the blood trickling out of his nose. I'm over there without consciously knowing what the fuck I'm doing. I'm down at his side, supporting his head, watching his busy eyes blaze and jive, brimming with baffled malevolence. I don't want him like this, I really don't. I want him punching me, kicking me. Franco, man, I, I'm sorry. It's out of the order, I'm sorry, man. I'm greeting. I'm holding Begbie in my arms and I'm greeting. I'm thinking of all the old times, all the good times, and I'm looking into his eyes and the rancour is leaving them like a dark curtain being drawn back to let in a serene light as his thin lips twist into a wicked smile. He, he is fucking well smiling at me. Then he tries to talk, says something like, I was like you. Or maybe I'm just hearing what I want to hear. Maybe there's a qualification. Then he starts coughing and a rivulet of blood trickles out for the side of his mouth. I try to say something, but I'm suddenly aware of somebody standing over us. Looking up, I behold a face which looks alien and familiar at the same time. 
I realise that it's Nelly Hunter, that he's had his facial tattoos removed, and I'm just going to say something in acknowledgement when his fist lashes out and cracks my jaw. My body jolts in shock and a dull throb registers in my face. Fuck me, that was a cracker. I see him spring back into the crowd of ghouls as I rise unsteadily to my feet. There's a hand on my shoulder and I turn sharply, fearing that I'm going to be battered to a pulp by Franco's mob, but it's only a green-jacketed paramedic. They get Franco onto a gurney and move him into the ambulance. I go to follow, but a policeman stands in front of me and says something that I can't make out. Another cop nods at the paramedic, then the first cop. He unbars my way, and I'm in the back of the ambulance as they slam the door shut and start off. I'm crouching over Franco, and I'm telling him to hold on. It's okay, Frank. I'm here, mate. I tell him. I'm here. I rub my jaw, which is fucked from Nelly's fist. I see her one, all right. Welcome to Leith. Welcome home, right enough. But where is that now? Leith? No. Amsterdam? No. If home is where the heart is, right now Diane's my home. I've got to get to the airport. I'm squeezing Franco's hand, but he's unconscious now, and the paramedics have put an oxygen mask on his face. Keep talking to him, one of them urges. This does not look fucking good. The weird thing is that over the years I thought that I'd wanted this moment, had even hoped for it, fantasised it. But now I'd wish for anything other than this. The ambulance guy doesn't need to prompt us, because I couldn't shut up if I wanted to. I... I meant to get together with you, Frank, put things right. I'm really sorry about that time in London, but Frank, I wasn't thinking straight. I just needed to get away, to get off the gear. I've been in Amsterdam, but I'm back here now for the time being, Frank. Met a nice lassie, you'd like her. I think a lot about the lass we used to have. The football and the links. How your ma was always good to me when I came round to yours. She always made us welcome. These things sort of stick with you. Mind we used to go to the state in Junction Street on Saturday morning for the cartoon shows. I'll take the scabby with cinema at the top of the walk. What was it called? The Salon. If we had the money, we'd go to Easter Road in the afternoon. Mind you, you used to be able to get a lift over. <laughs> then, then we got caught spraying our names and YLT on the back of Leith Academy Primary. We were only 11, nearly greeting, so the police went and let us go. <laughs> you mind that? That was me, you, Spud, Tommy and Craig Kincaid. <laughs> Mind the time we both shagged Karen Mackey. Oh, what about that time at Motherwell when you battered that big cunt and I, and I got fucking lifted for it? And the strange thing is that as I'm saying all this and remembering it, feeling it, part of my brain is thinking something else. I'm thinking that sick boy is a born exploiter. Instinctive, a creature of his times. But his effectiveness is curtailed by the fact that he's far too into the process, the intrigue and the social side of it all. He thinks it's significant, that it actually means something. So he gets immersed in it all, and he never just stops to sit back and remember to do the simple thing. Like taking the money and running. He won't be pleased when he sees that the money's gone, and me with it. His self-hate at being done twice will probably precipitate some sort of mental breakdown. I might end up having offed both him and poor Franco. Franco. Apart from the oxygen mask, he looks exactly the same. Then there's a ringing coming from him, and I realise it's the mobile phone going off in his jacket pocket. I glance at the paramedic who nods at me. I take it out and click on. A shout rings in my ear. Frank! It's sick boy's voice. Did you get Renton? Answer me, Frank, it's me, Simon! Me, me, me! I hang up and switch the phone off. I think that was his girlfriend trying to get through, I hear myself telling the paramedic. I'll call her later. We get to the hospital and I'm in a dumb haze. 
as a skinny, nervous-looking young doctor's telling me that Franco's still unconscious, which I had already worked out, and that they're taking him into intensive care. It's just a question of trying to stabilise his condition, uh, then we'll uh, run tests to see what kind of damage has been done, he says so tentatively it's almost as if he knows who they're looking after. There's nothing more I can do. But I go up to the intensive care ward where I catch a nurse putting an IV drip in his arm. I nod gently at her and she responds with a tight economical professional smile. I'm thinking about how I want to be with Diane at the airport and how I don't particularly want to be here when Nelly and some of Franco's mates come crashing through the door. Sorry, Frank, I say before making it go. Then I turn quickly and add, Be strong. Exiting the ward, I head off at pace along the corridor, down the marble stair, my soles nearly slipping on the surface, come out through two sets of swing doors and dart across the forecourt in a waiting taxi. We're making good time out to the airport because the traffic's light, but I'm still late, very late. We pull up outside departures and I see Diane waving to me and I run to meet her. She stays rooted to the spot, but thaws when I get closer. Her understandable chagrin evaporating as she registers the state I'm in. God, what's wrong? I thought you'd stood me up for an old flame or something. For a second I nearly laugh. There was never any danger of that, I say, shaking as I grab hold of her, breathing her in. I'm trying to keep a grip on myself too because I need to be on that plane with a greater desire than I've ever wanted for any fix. We hurry to the check-in. But they won't even book us through. We've missed the London fleet and therefore our connection. Missed the bastard by minutes, seconds even, but missed it. Fortunately we have open tickets and we book onto the earliest San Francisco via London flight which is tomorrow lunchtime. We both agree that we can't face the city again and we elect to check into a nearby airport hotel where I explain fully what happened. Sitting on the red and green quilt-covered bed with Diane, still in shock, her hand in mine, I'm tracing the thin blue veins at the back of it as I recount my tale. It's crazy, but the ranch bastard would have killed us. I just... froze. I doubt I could have even tried to defend myself. The most mental thing about it, though, was... after. It was like we were still mates. Like I hadn't ripped them off or not like that. It's just... It's so fucking bizarre. But there's a part of me that still really likes the cunt. I mean, you're the psychologist. What's that about? Diane purses her lips and opens her eyes wider in contemplation. He's part of your life, I suppose. Do you feel guilty about your part in his accident? A sudden focused coldness comes over me. No. He shouldn't have run across the street like that. The room is centrally heated, but Diane holds the coffee cup in both hands as if to draw warmth from it. And it strikes me that she's in shock about Franco as well, though she never knew him. It's like it's transmitting from me to her. We try to change the subject, to pick ourselves up by looking ahead. She's telling me that she doesn't think that her thesis on porn is very good. And in any case, she fancies a year off. Maybe even check out a college in the States. What will we do in San Francisco? Just hang out? I might start up a club again. No, but probably not. It's too much hassle. Diane and me might get into that website shite become dot-commers. We've planned and fantasised about this for long enough, but... I can't think of that right now. All I can think of is Begbie. And Diane, of course. She's turned out to be a cool woman, but she always was. It was me who was a bit too young and immature for us to make a proper go of things at the time. This time we'll ride it out as long as the love or the cash lasts. The next morning we're up early and have breakfast in the room. I phone the hospital for news of Franco. There's no change, he's still unconscious, but the x-rays confirm the extent of his injuries. He has a broken leg and a shattered hip bone, as well as some cracked ribs, a fractured arm and skull, and some internal damage. Should be a relief to have him incapacitated, but I still feel terrible about what happened to Franco. And yes, 
Right now I do feel guilty. We head back over to the airport, her excited about getting away, me just more anxious about the consequences of sticking around here a second longer than we have to. Seventy nine. Easy jet. Simon's been phoning like crazy all morning. We're at the airport early doors to catch the easy jet back to Edinburgh, the first available flight. Terry and his American porn girl Carla are seeing us off, only because Terry's wanting to get the keys to our room off him, which is booked for two more days, and Simon won't part with them until the last minute. He keeps looking at Terry, who's now emerged from the airport shop with unbridled suspicion. I really appreciate you coming back with me, Nicky, he says, because you could stay here another couple of days with Curtis and Mel and have a ball at the awards party. You'll probably walk it as well. It's your moment, Nicky. We need to stick together, honey, I tell him, gripping his hand. Don't you worry, sick boy. Me and Carla here'll enjoy the sweet aid all, Terry says, looking at his new girl, then at me, obviously worried in case I change my mind. Yeah, it's so kind of you, she happily murmurs. Simon looks wildly discomforted, and picking up on it, Terry says earnestly, I'll be a great ambassador for seven rides, and I'll not take the pish on hotel expenses. But Simon's not hearing him. He's called the pub and he's talking to Alison, and if anything, he's even more deflated than ever. You are fucking joking. I don't believe it. He turns to Terry and me. The cunt in Polis and the fucking customers and excise are down the pub. They've confiscated the videos. They're closing me down. Ali! He snaps back into the phone. Tell nay cunt out. Tell them I've gone to France. It's the truth. Is there any sign of Begbie or Renton? There's a short silence, then Simon barks. What? Then gasps. Hospitalised the cunt. A fucking coma. Rents. My heart almost jumps out of my mouth. Mark. What's happened? Simon clicks off the phone. Renton has done Begby. He's hospitalised the cunt. Begby's in a coma from which they reckon he won't wake up. Spud told Ali he saw it at the fit of the walk last night. Thank God Mark's okay, I say aloud, and Simon's eyes suddenly screw me in ghastly intent. Well, Simon, I whisper, he's got our money. What money's this then? Terry asks, his ears pricking up. Just some cash, I'll lend him. Simon shakes his head. Anyway, Terry, here's the hotel keys. He quickly produces them from his pocket, throws them to him and says bitterly, Enjoy. Cheers, Terry says, grabbing Carla's waist. Dinny, you worry about that, he winks. Then he considers. Funny about Mark sorting out Begbie. A dark horse, all right. I reckon that kung fu stuff was shite and all. Just goes to show you, buddy. Still. He smiles. See yous. And skips away across the forecourt with his porn star shag. I watch him shuffle off, a fly in shit with all his needs met, having the time of his life, while Simon, who should be the same, has a pained, ulcerated expression. Terry on his tab in Cannes for two days gives him yet something else to worry about. During the flight, Simon's full of rancour for the world and is still seething as we come into land at Edinburgh Airport. Now, you still don't know that Mark's ripped us off, so take it easy. We had an amazing time. The film went down well. That's positive. <sighs> he coughs, his shades perched on top of his head, his neck craning, looking around anxiously as we pick up our luggage and head through passport control and customs. Then he stops in his tracks because just about fifty yards away, Mark and Diane are standing there, preparing to go through the departure gates. Diane goes past first, and as Mark's showing his documents to the airline official, Simon screams at the top of his voice, Renton! Mark looks at him, smiles faintly, and waves, and then steps through the gates. Simon goes sprinting towards him and tries to run right through the gates, but the official and the security man won't let him pass. Stop that thief! He screams as Mark and Diane's backs recede. 
I'm following, looking at her, wondering if she'll turn around, but she doesn't. Tell them, Nicky! Simon beseeches me. I stand there in breathless shock. What can I say? He turns back to the official and the security guard. More of them are appearing now. Listen, he pleads. You have to let me through the departure gates. You need a valid boarding card, sir, the clerk informs him. Simon's heaving, trying to control his breathing. Listen, that man has stolen something that belongs to me. I have to get through that fucking gate. That's surely a matter for the police, sir. If I can radio the airport police... Simon's grinding his teeth together and shaking his head. Forget it. Forget it! He spits, and he's walking away. I follow him to the departures board. Fuck me, they're all boarding now! London Heathrow, London City, Manchester, Frankfurt, Dublin, Amsterdam, Munich. Where could they be going? Renton and that fucking devious little cow! He screeches, setting aside some more of that special time he reserves to humiliate himself in public. Then he crouches down in the middle of the busy concourse, his head in his hands, perfectly still. I put my hand on his shoulder. Somebody, a woman with an orangey perm, asks... Is he all right? I smile at her in appreciation for her concern. After a bit, I whisper to him, We have to go, Simon. We're drawing too much attention. Are we? He says in a small little boy's voice. Are we? Then he stands up and strides across towards the exits, clicking on the mobile phone. We head towards the taxi queue as he clicks off the phone and looks at me with a tight smile on his lips. Renton. He breaks into a spluttering sob and slaps his own face. Renton has taken my money. He's cleaned out the bank. Renton had his own masters in Amsterdam, all the finished copies in that Mrs. Warehouse. Who owns the masters owns the film. He has the masters and the money. How did he get the information? He wails disconsolately. I call Lauren to find that Diane's packed her bags. We climb into an airport taxi and I say sadly, Leith. Simon rests his head back against the seat. He's got our fucking money. It's all been the money. I have to know where he's coming from. What about the film? I ask. Fuck the film, he snaps. But what about our mission? I hear myself ask. What about the revolutionary role pornography has in... Fuck all that. It was always just a load of shite for wankers who can't get a bird to pull off to and a way for the rest of us hitting our sell-by dates to keep firing into young fit Fanny. You've got two categories. Category one, me. Category two, the rest of the world. You can divide the others up into two subgroups. Those who do as I say and the superfluous. It was sport, Nicky. Just a bit of sport. It's the money we need. The fucking money. Fucking Renton. Later, we're in Simon's flat reading the evening news which Rab has brought down. He tells us that they seized all the video stock and the tapes at the pub as well as the bar accounts. The article says that both the police and HM Customs and Excise are looking for him and that charges may follow. An accompanying piece has an unflattering profile of him and his drugs and pornography scandal, and mentions a police investigation into his affairs. I'm the only fucking one they want. Me. What about you, cunts? Might have something to do with the credits on the box, Rab quips, and I struggle to stifle a snigger. Simon seems a broken man as he cracks open a bottle of whiskey. Rab wants to fight in court. I'm into sticking the gather. I'm going to prepare a speech. He slurs as the drinks go down. I realise Rab's been out on the piss and he's feeling it. What about you, Nicky? He asks. I want to see how things go. I tell them, nursing my drink. Simon snatches the paper from me and still has the pomposity to take exception to being described as a pornographer. A pretty crass term for somebody who's made the artistic decision to work creatively within the sphere of adult erotica he says with forced bluster. Then he looks abjectly miserable as he moans. This is going to kill my mother. With an expression of sheer dread, he checks the phone messages. 
There's one from Terry. Some good news and some bad news, folks. Kurt won best male newcomer. He's away out celebrating. But some French boy got best new director. A lassie in Carla's film got best bird. I feel a deflated sag of disappointment, and Simon shoots me a tense glance that says, I told you you should have done anal. Terry rambles on. But it's no all bad news, cos it was Carla's film, a buttfucker in Pussy City that won top prize. They're a sound crew and I'm well in there. Simon spits bitterly and is about to say something, but the next message silences him. It's his mother, and she's very upset, breaking down over the phone. He gets up and throws on his jacket. I've got to square this one with Mama. You want me to come? I ask. No, it's better if I go alone, he says as he heads out with Rab, who's anxious to get back to his wife and kid, following behind. I'm relieved, and I sit on the couch, my head bursting, and I'm almost physically shaking as I think of what I'm about to do. Eighty. Scam number 18,753. I'm in shock. It's like everything good's gone and the rest's been turned upside down. My mother's crying on the answer machine, asking how the paper could get away with telling all those horrible lies about her son. Rab calls round, obviously enjoying himself. I'm too fucked to bother. But I'll call round to my mother's and manage to just about convince her that it's all jealous fabrication and is now in the hands of my solicitors. It was some performance. My outrage requiring reserves of energy that I didn't know I had. I head away thinking about Franco. How that wanker fucked things up so badly for me and himself. I'm heading back home to Nicky. Thinking of who could have grasped me up. The list in my head keeps growing. Renton. So fucking obvious. Terry. That cunt. Because I dropped him. Paula. Fat cow being tipped off to what I was up to. Mo. Wanted the pub. Spud. Jealous junkie fucker. Eddie. Nosy old cunt. Philip and his team. Little bastards. Begby. I'm no a fucking grass. Me thinks a lady doth protest too much. Burrow. The first down here to gloat. Renton again. An evil parting shot from that wicked cunt. I call Mel and Curtis and Can. Tell them that I'll get something together again soon. I just need a bit of time to lick my wounds and pay back some scum who fucked me over. Then I'll be in touch. But until then, go for it and take it where you can get it. Just watch what you sign, I warn them. At the foot of the walk, I buy some flowers for Nicky and think about taking her to the Stockbridge restaurant for a meal tonight because she's been a rock before we do a runner for London. She's gone when I get back. Must be at the shops getting something to cook a meal. No way. Fuck the police and the customs. I want to go out. To show them all I'm not beaten. This is just a temporary setback. I'll see a note on the coffee table. Simon. I'm off to visit Mark and Diane. You won't find us. That I guarantee. We promise to enjoy the cash. Love, Nicky. P.S. When I said you were the best lover I ever had, I was exaggerating. But you weren't bad when you tried. Remember, we're all faking it. P.P.S. As you said about the British, watching people get fucked has become our favourite sport. I read it twice. I stare silently at myself in the mirror on the wall. Then, with all the force I can muster, I headbutt the reflection of the fool I see in it. The glass breaks and falls out of the mountain, crashing to the floor. I look down at its broken pieces and can see the blood pouring like splatters of rain onto it. Is there a stupider cunt alive than you? I ask slowly at the bloodied face and the shattered fragments. Now it's seven years bad luck, I laugh. I sit down on the couch and pick up the note again, let it tremble in my hand, then crush it and hurl it across the room. Is there a stupider cunt alive? Then a face comes into my head. Francois is hurt. I say cruelly to myself, imitating a treacherous Hollywood Roman senator from Spartacus. I must go to him. 
I wrap a bandage round my head and tie an old bandana over it. Then I head up to the Royal Infirmary to find the intensive care wards. Outside I pass a hospital stationery shop and think about a card, but instead by a big black magic marker. I'm going down a long deserted corridor in this Victorian part of the building, thinking about all the misery and torment which has taken place in this house of pain. There's a heaviness in my chest and the place feels cold. They've built a modern replacement out at Little France and they're running this little place down. The light seems to have dimmed badly in this section of the hospital and as I mount the staircase, my shoes squeaking loudly on each step, I realise that I feel afraid. Things are churning around in my head and I'm terrified that he'll have come too. When I get up to the ward, I feel easier. There only seems to be one nurse on duty on a ward that holds six people, five old boys who seem fucked, and Franco, who is lying there unconscious. He looks inert and waxy, as if he's already a corpse. He's not on a respirator, but it's hard to detect any breathing with the naked eye. There's three tubes hooked up to him. Two seem to be going in for saline and blood, one coming out for piss. I'm his only visitor. I take a seat close to him. Pauvre, pauvre François, I say to the dormant figure, clad in bandage and plaster. Somewhere in all that is Begbie. He's fucking well gone. I'm reading his charts. Looks pretty bad, Frank, the nurse said. He's very poorly. It'll take a lot of spirit for him to pull through. I told her. Frank's a fighter. I look at that plasma sachet going into the tube, which goes into his veins. Stupid cunt. I should piss in a milk bottle and attach it to the tube. Instead, I take the magic marker and write some affectionate graffiti on his stooky as I chat to him. He did me again, Frank. I fucked up. Forgot an important lesson. You never go back. Move on. You've got to move on or you end up like... Well, like you, Frank. It's good for me to see you like this, Franco. It's good to know there's always some sad, fucked-up cunt worse off than yourself. A smile, admiring my handiwork. Faggot ass. Mind when I first met you, Frank? When you first spoke to me? I mind. I was playing football on the links with Tommy and some other boys for the flats. Then this bunch of yous came over. I think Rents and Spud were there. We were still at primary. It was a weekend after Hibs had got beaten 4-2 at Easter Road by Juventus. Altafini grabbed a poacher's hat-trick. You came up and asked me if I was a fucking eye tie. I tell you I was Scottish. Then Tommy, trying to help, goes, It's only his ma that's Italian, eh, hey, Simon? You grabbed my hair and twisted it. Said something witty like, Scotland fucking rules. And this is what we did, we dirty wee tally bastard. As you pulled me around, taking me on a humiliating walk, shouting in my face, Shat it in the fucking war. All that stuff. I was trying to scream that I was Hibs. I'd been cheering them on, doing my nut when Stanton puts two one in front. It was useless. I had to take it, your brutish, senseless bullying. Till you became bored and picked another target. I guess he was winding you up then, encouraging you to be the bad bastard, cruelty gleaming in his eyes. Aye, Renton's grin was as wide as Victoria Dock, a cunt. But Franco just lies there, his twisted, hateful simpleton's mouth clamped tight. It was all going so fucking well, Frank. You ever felt that, Franco? That you were on your game? That you were rocking? And then some cunt cheats you out of the fucking lot? Because there's got to be some fucking rules, Franco. Even you wouldn't do that to one of your own. I know I wouldn't. If you're running a proper business, a real operation, you need trust. I play games, Frank. You'll never understand this, but I'm more of a warrior than you'll ever be. I believe in the class war. I believe in the battle of the sexes. I believe in my tribe. I believe in the righteous, intelligent, clued-up section of the working class against the brain-dead, moronic masses as well as the mediocre, soulless bourgeoisie. I believe in punk rock, 
in Northern Soul, in Acid House, in Maud, in Rock and Roll. I also believe in pre-commercial righteous rap and hip-hop. That's been my manifesto, Franco. You've seldom, if ever, fitted into that manifesto. Yes, I admire your outlaw instincts, but the bruiser psycho thing just leaves me cold. It's crass banalities that offend my sense of good taste. Renton, though. I thought Renton shared my vision. My punk vision. But what is he? Scruffy Murphy with a brain and even fewer morals. I'm wondering if this cunt can hear me. No way, he's never fucking waking up again. Or if he does, it's as a total veg. I'm very disappointed, Frank. You know what that cunt took from me? I'll tell you in your simple terms. Sixty-odd fucking grand. Yes, it makes your three grand seem the small fucking beer it is. But the money means nothing. You took my dreams, Frank. Do you understand that? Do you get it? Hello? Any cunt home? No. Thought not. Alex McLeish. The boy Begby's disciplinary record is nothing short of deplorable. I can't see anybody giving him another chance now. I'm sure that all right-thinking people would endorse those wise comments, Alex. And to be quite frank, I'd go further. I would charge Francis Begby with bringing the game into disrepute. And on the subject of being frank, let's hear from another well-known Frank, who also plies his trade in Leith. Frank Sose? This is, uh, how you say, true? Monsieur Begby is combative. There is no savoir-faire. But you cannot take the aggression from his game, as it would not be him. I'm still idly doodling on Franco's plaster cast with my magic marker as I pass the day with him. I love to suck cock. But I helped that Renton bastard. I kept him out of your fucking clutches. Why? Maybe because of that time back in London, when you freaked out and accused me of being in it with him. You punched me and broke my tooth. Disfigured me. I had to get it capped. Not even a fucking apology. But I was fucking well wrong to keep him from you. Never again. I shall find him, Frank. And I vow that should you manage to come out of that coma and repair your broken body, you will be the first, the absolute first, to know of his whereabouts. I bend right over the fucking drooling vegetable stooge. Get well soon, beggar boy. I've always wanted to call it to you, and my heart leaps out of my chest as something fucking grabs my wrist. I look down, and his hand is like a vice around it. And when I look up, his eyes have opened, and those blazing coals of enmity are staring right into my lacerated, penitent inner self. <laughs>